Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you very much for joining our event today. My name is Roxy Iqbal. I am the Strategic Advisor at Deep Knowledge Group, and I will be your moderator for today's presentations and discussions. Our event today is called Invest Tech Innovation, a, a new quarterly conference for all prominent industry figures to review and discuss the latest trends in private equity markets. This exclusive event is essentially your opportunity to explore the latest cutting edge investment solutions, to learn about the emerging multi-trillion dollar deep tech and longevity industries, to access our online breakout area as well, so you can network as you have already been doing in the chat, and also to potentially generate your own financial leads. This event is being recorded today, and of course, we will be sharing this later for reference and for those who were unable to attend. Um, as mentioned, we do have a great chat facility below. I encourage you to please leave your comments and also um, to review and provide your feedback um, for um, updates as well. And Katrina, our um, host of this Zoom, will also be sending you details of the speakers so you will have access to their social channels and also their contact details as well. Um, I should finally mention that we also have a Q&A box at the bottom, which I would encourage you to please send all your questions through the Q&A. So please try and um, separate your chat and your comments and your feedback in, in that function. And for questions that you would like directly answering, please send them in Q&A. And if you specifically want a certain speaker or panelist to answer that, please um, uh, tag them or add their name before your question. Um, okay, wonderful. So without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to now welcome our next, um, well, our first and primary keynote speaker, Dmitry Kaminsky, an experienced longevity industry investor and entrepreneur, and the founder of Deep Knowledge Ventures and, of course, Deep Knowledge Group. Dmitry Kaminsky is an innovative entrepreneur and an investor active in the fields of longevity, space tech, deep tech, precision medicine, and artificial intelligence. He is also the founder and general partner of Deep Knowledge Group, a consortium of commercial and non-profit organizations active on many fronts in the realm of deep tech and frontier technology. And frontier technology. And this ranges from scientific research to investment, entrepreneurship, analytics, media, philanthropy, and much more. Uh, dear Dimitri, it's an absolute pleasure to have you open this conference for us today. And the floor is indeed yours. Uh, thank you, Roxy, for introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, we are opening a series of conferences, uh, which will be um, dedicated to the topic of uh, innovations required in the field of uh, uh, fundraising, uh, investment relations, and uh, multiple other uh, components, which are required for efficient um, evolution of uh, tech-driven startups uh, within deep tech industry, and at the same time, which are required for multiple times of uh, different investors who are actually uh, operating in uh, uh, private equity. Um, <clears throat> in my particular presentation, uh, I will be speaking about, uh, uh, from my point of view, outdated model of uh, venture capital in private equity, especially in there of uh, deep tech revolution, which we're witnessing uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, in our opinion, um, uh, for to ensure a stable uh, evolution, progress in uh, anything related to uh, deep tech uh, field, uh, a lot of innovations are uh, required to happen uh, in the next several years. And um, because um, the way how things are happening in the field, uh, despite the tremendous progress on the uh, scientific technological side, uh, the progress in, uh, in the field of uh, venture capital, uh, I, we actually do not see that there is much uh, uh, progress in the sense that most of the um, Venture funds, uh, they, they're using uh, the same technologies which they, they were using 10 or even 20 years ago. Just very briefly, Deep Knowledge Group, this is a consortium of uh, for profit and non profit organizations. We have uh, in total 12 analytical subsidiaries, and we are quite focused on uh, additional data, data and uh, expertise aggregation. Um, we are having a number of uh, investment vehicles. And we have uh, we're having a number of uh, non-profit uh, charities in, <clears throat> in our consortium. The major trends uh, 
which we were witnessing over the last uh, 10 years. Um, so first of all, uh, the industry of startups, the venture funds, uh, greatly was evolving to tech industry. And then nowadays, uh, whenever you're hearing uh, the word startups, uh, in absolutely most cases, uh, maybe at least uh, 80 or 20 persons, uh, 80, 90 persons of them will be uh, somehow tech uh, driven. And actually over the last couple of years, we also saw um, gradual, gradually evolving uh, tech industry towards deep tech industry. Uh, at the same time, we saw that uh, uh, the operational model of venture funds, family office, private equity firms, it started uh, you know, to merge uh, in some capacity. Uh, previously, they were highly specialized. Now, many of them are uh, becoming both, for example, family office at the same time can, can be a venture funds and, and uh, vice versa. Uh, we also saw uh, establishing and then uh, quite successful uh, growth of um, crowd investment or syndicate investment, uh, uh, in most cases, um, like seed angel, angel type of uh, investment uh, uh, platforms, such as angel list and uh, seeders. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what was happening with um, stock exchanges, that uh, the price and complexity um, required for the company to be listed at, uh, at the big stock exchange, such as NASDAQ or LAN stock exchange, so it was also uh, growing quite significantly. And uh, another uh, phenomenon, I would say phenomenon, uh, which we saw uh, over the last two years, it was uh, this uh, quite an unusual uh, rise and then quick decline of uh, so-called SPAC uh, model. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in, our, in our opinion, this is the direct evidence that there is uh, very significant unsatisfied uh, demand for liquidity by, by already quite matured uh, companies, including tech companies, but uh, which are not uh, yet listed. Um, <clears throat> and uh, despite this uh, significant technological progress over the last uh, couple of years, uh, the problems which were uh, present in this private equity venture uh, uh, investment field, they're almost the same as, as it was uh, uh, five or ten years ago, with some uh, uh, additional specifics which are also evolving because of uh, uh, deep tech start uh, tech startups are now tending to to, to uh, grow towards uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, science te technology. So, like from tech to deep tech, um, the very same way as uh, in 2022, uh, founders of uh, tech and science driven startups. Uh, if, they are, uh, if they need to, uh, to raise money, they have to, to spend enormous amount of uh, time, energy uh, to actually ju just to, to get in front of uh, potential relevant in investors. So not to say that to actually the close investment round, they will have to, to spend uh, even more. Um, and uh, they're not professionals in, in that. They are actually scientists. Uh, they are tech, um, you know, specialists in tech. So this is uh, one of these quite significant gap uh, which we're witnessing. Uh, plus to that, um, uh, this is very specific to deep tech startups. So uh, opposite to just uh, tech or low tech startups, let's say those which were uh, successfully developing uh, mobile apps, uh, for example, five years ago. So those guys uh, to, to create MVP, typically they required on, uh, something between half, half of a million, uh, maybe up to one million uh, dollars. And typically, they could uh, uh, deliver an MVP within one year. So, uh, however, in case of uh, deep tech startups, uh, the typical timeline will be uh, between three to five years, and uh, the budget will be between five to ten uh, millions of uh, dollars. Therefore, absolutely most of uh, deep tech startups, uh, it might be considered that 99% of them, they're actually not surpassing this uh, Death Valley in deep tech industry because uh, uh, they need uh, for delivery just of MVP and to actually uh, to make uh, B round or in some cases even A round, uh, they need uh, to have quite significant uh, budget uh, and uh, time uh, horizon uh, already at the, at the seed level. 
Uh, on the other hand, investment funds, including venture funds, uh, they they're using uh, outdated techniques for due sourcing and due diligence. They, uh, like most of them are using the same techniques as they did uh, uh, in 2010-2015. Uh, on the other hand, LPs, uh, the actual investors into uh, venture funds, so they're having issues with uh, the point that uh, opposite to hedge funds, if they're putting money into uh, venture funds, uh, they can't withdraw the, those money uh, unless there will be liquidity then. So they're kind of like, uh, locking up their money and uh, this is uh, uh, this issue is not changing over the last uh, several decades. Uh, the same issue if they're investing uh, directly into private equity, into uh, companies, into startups. So they, uh, those uh, direct investors will have uh, might have issues with uh, secondary market transactions because of uh, required uh, raw for procedure in most cases. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are also good news. So during the uh, last couple of years, especially during already 2022, uh, we saw how a number of um, so-called SPV platforms, this is uh, one of the kind of recent trend, which is um, evolving quite quickly. Uh, so these platforms, uh, in particular, for example, such as Wobana, VK, and allocations in, uh, in the US, uh, this is a fully digitalized uh, platform with automized KYC, IML process uh, with uh, number of um, additional IT-based, uh, digital-based features. And um, namely, they're, they're creating uh, in this very easy mode, SPV, SPV special purpose uh, financial vehicles uh, on a customized basis. So for each uh, particular individual deal, uh, there could be created uh, individual SPV and uh, the terms of that SPV could be very well designed for that particular uh, deal. Uh, and this is, by the way, besides other uh, interesting features also provides uh, additional in, uh, more enhanced uh, um, same liquidity for um, investors uh, uh, because typically for those SPV they can uh, float their position or resell their position on the secondary market so this is quite uh, interesting uh, development which is um, incentivizing uh, investors to, to invest into tech-driven startups. Uh, we also do see that uh, multiple digitalized asset management investment relations uh, platforms uh, evolving. Uh, most of them, many of them are somehow related to private equity. Uh, and um, I'm quite sure that this will, will trend, uh, will see even more uh, progress in, in, in this particular domain over the next couple of years. Uh, we also do see uh, that multiple legal tech, rec tech projects and solutions uh, evolving, uh, improving uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And this is uh, quite um, beneficial for private equity markets. Um, also to see that uh, tech industries uh, are growing uh, with steady dynamics despite the recent market uh, fluctuations. Uh, and uh, we do not see that uh, investors are uh, losing uh, interest to deep tech, uh, frontier technologies. Uh, I, I think uh, what we see that even despite the market fluctuations, that interest is only growing because uh, anyway, like any reasonable person uh, now on the platform probably do understand that uh, technological progress is uh, really increasing and uh, um, it's, it's the dynamic of growth also increasing. So the, this is quite relevant uh, not only for let's say, tech, tech entrepreneurs or startups, but also for, for investors. Uh, just a very short overview of uh, what we are doing at Deep Knowledge Group uh, on modernization of investment technologies. Uh, so first of all, uh, we kind of like, uh, um, promoting this uh, particular term in this tech because uh, uh, of the rise of deep tech, uh, the modernization of investment technology is required to match the current technological progress. So that's why uh, if there was FinTech as a tech-driven uh, financial services, uh, in this tech, it's uh, the same tech-driven investment relations, uh, fundraising uh, process uh, uh, technologies. Um, and we are in opinion that um, uh, in 2022 and uh, in, in the next years, 
much more advanced uh, techniques for uh, um, tech-driven, uh, maybe in some cases automized or even AI-driven um, big data analytical systems uh, will be required to optimize due diligence process uh, and to actually uh, to resolve the issue of over complexity of uh, companies dealing with frontier deep tech uh, uh, like investors they need to, to have uh, uh, matching techniques for due diligence um, <clears throat> and uh, um, on the other hand uh, for, for deep tech startups uh, they should be established and uh, better developed specific uh, frameworks which will give them opportunity uh, to focus on actual and uh, development of their science and technology uh, uh, solutions rather than spending uh, that time on uh, just kind of like, uh, trying to meet with investors through different types of uh, previously uh, common uh, interaction technologies. Um, <clears throat> the very same uh, uh, some innovations, some uh, new solutions uh, would be very beneficial if they would be implemented uh, for the uh, benefits of investors, uh, literally to uh, help them uh, to optimize, uh, to, to increase uh, at least in some capacity liquidity uh, in the private equity. Uh, because uh, for professional investors, uh, there should be trading investment platforms which will be uh, will give them opportunity to invest into tech, into uh, technological IP, intellectual property, uh, um, a little bit closer to, to the sense how it is done on uh, uh, stock exchanges or uh, exchanges for commodities. Because uh, in our opinion, uh, deep tech uh, will be commoditizing. It will be uh, becoming uh, new asset class and uh, therefore there will be more and more uh, specialized uh, training investment platforms required to to actually address that uh, uh, issue in the sense that uh, to consider deep tech and uh, tech driven uh, uh, private equity as an emerging asset class um, i wrote this book uh, one year and a half ago but one week ago we already published the second edition Longevity Industry 1.0, defining the biggest and most complex industry in human history. Uh, so uh, here, uh, with this uh, series of books, we're actually working on uh, to, to accelerate commoditization of uh, longevity industry. Uh, so we profiled uh, 50,000 companies in this industry. We uh, 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 established framework and distributed those companies across, uh, categorized them across the 20 sectors. Um, also, last uh, week we published uh, open source uh, longevity industry journal. This will be annual journal. Uh, this 400 pages uh, free of charge um, journal on this industry and, uh, and both uh, startups and investors and multiple other participants can uh, actually understand better what this industry is about and uh, what uh, opportunities are uh, out there. Uh, for professional investors, and uh, participants of the industry, we at Deep Knowledge Group we created this big data analytics ecosystem, longevity investment big data analytics uh, dashboard. Um, by this link, Deep Innovation Tech, you can also uh, review our several other uh, dashboards, uh, not only the longevity industry, but also deep tech industry. There are some uh, specific solutions for, for example, deep tech in UK or space tech industry. Uh, not only private equity, but also on public equity, but uh, for today, uh, discussion probably uh, those solutions for private equity would be much more interesting. So, so there are quite a lot of uh, specific features. Uh, we are using uh, uh, AI, we're using machine learning, we're using uh, even deep learning to, uh, to extract some patterns and provide some, uh, um, some much more enhanced uh, uh, analysis, including uh, automized uh, SWOT and comparative uh, analysis. Um, longevity financial industry it will be one of my next books uh, in this book i will be uh, providing some uh, uh, inputs regarding that uh, longevity financial industry uh, also will have to be uh, quite uh, modernized in the next several years to match uh, 
uh, with the uh, current uh, significant progress which uh, is happening on the side of uh, science and in technology uh, related to aging research and environmental longevity. Uh, these two books, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, uh, was written by Klaus Schwab uh, in 2018, founder of World Economic Forum, and The Future is Faster Than You Think was published by Peter Diamandis, uh, founder of um, Singularity University. Uh, uh, this will be, uh, I'm preparing to publish this book, uh, The Fifth Industrial Revolution, the future is faster, but much more complex than you think. Uh, in, this, in, this, in this book, besides uh, technological framework for upcoming fifth industrial revolution by our estimations, uh, this revolution uh, will actually happen uh, approximately 10 years from now. Um, but uh, in this book, um, there will be a number of chapters uh, related to commoditization of uh, deep tech and longevity industries, uh, how this uh, industry will become uh, new asset classes and why uh, specialized uh, new modern solutions will be required uh, to accommodate the uh, financial side of uh, this emerging uh, uh, frontier uh, technologies and uh, uh, science-driven, uh, advanced uh, technology-driven industries. Uh, so to, for the conclusion, in this tech, by the level of sophistication, should match with the dynamic of technological progress in the era of uh, deep tech revolution. And uh, our conference uh, today, um, uh, some of my colleagues and uh, our prominent guests, uh, I think uh, later to today, they will be delivering quite a, lo a lot of interesting insights and uh, the same will be tomorrow. So uh, that's why uh, stay online. And I assume there will be also a panel discussion today later. And uh, as um, our moderator, uh, mentioned uh, this conference will be uh, video recorded and uh, besides that I, th I think that subscribers to, to the conference will uh, will be getting some uh, news uh, emails uh, over over the next uh, several months and at the same time we'll be planning to organize uh, the next conference I think uh, something around by uh, September and that conference most likely will be hybrid physical in London and uh, uh, virtual uh, by Zoom more internationally. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, to Dmitry Kaminsky. Thank you for your time and the effort. Um, and it was extremely insightful. Thank you very much for your time. Um, just to reiterate what Dimitri has just said, please, if you have a look in the chat function below, there are several links that have been kindly shared. And these links will take you directly to uh, not only some of the incredible books that Dimitri has um, authored, um, but also to the platforms uh, mentioned as well, and um, to all the various different projects that um, Dimitri is very, very sort of um, keenly involved in, um, especially as a thought leader as well. Um, and to those of you who, are, who have joined, um, uh, please note that this session is being recorded, so you will have an opportunity to review a lot of the materials from earlier and later on as well. Lovely. So moving on to our next speaker, I am very pleased and excited to announce um, Anastasia Litt, who will be our next keynote speaker. Anastasia, hello. <laughs> um, hello, hello everyone. <laughs> um, Anastasia is a director of investor relations uh, for the Europe and the Middle East and North Africa regions at Deep Knowledge Group. She is a very skilled fintech specialist. And she has a very solid background in international business developments with two master's degrees in finance and banking, as well as international trade, which she has um, gained internationally as well. Um, Anastasia is an expert in her craft. She has experience uh, working with strategic partnerships, investment management, um, corporate finance and analytics as well. And at Deep Knowledge Group, she holds a very complex role in which she ensures the smooth functioning of various different departments, including the departments that look after longevity, deep tech, AI, deep pharma, fintech, as well as in best tech as well. Anastasia, it's a pleasure to meet you and to in introduce you to our audience. And um, the floor is now yours. 
Thank you so much, Roxy. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you, Dmitry, for his uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, so today we are going to talk about what is an IMC and what is it Eden is about this financial structured product. Uh, first of all, uh, let's come back to the longevity industry as Deep Knowledge Group is a consortium that is devoted to the longevity industry, uh, which unites different kind of sectors and industries uh, that are connected to the longevity industries that allow you to increase your health span and live longer. So here you can see our activities as well as we also issue our structured products uh, as SPVs and IMCs as uh, part of our agenda. So the longevity ecosystem combines like 50,000 uh, of the companies and you can see it's a big number of different uh, subsectors and industries at the slides and you can see uh, the big cloud of the startups and you need to understand uh, which strategy to implement, how to invest in such a big amount in case you would like to invest in the longevity deep tech or either, um, other different industries. So uh, typically uh, the active demand certificate is important to the qualified or so-called professional sophisticated investors. Uh, they uh, often come to the asset manager in the client's bank and the private bank, you know, wealth management, though they allow their asset manager to manage their assets, their money. And uh, this approach uh, has its own limitations. First of all, it becomes difficult to, as the number of the client grows. So the asset manager is limited if you want to find a good one. Uh, sometimes you, you will have to lose some money before you find a good manager. At the same time, some securities have a large minimum investment amount. So uh, if just as asset manager just manages only your money, you can skip some good opportunities. There are other types as such as invest in the investment fund or in the ETF where the asset manager can uh, scale uh, your investments by imposing it to, to the bigger fund. But in this case, so you should understand that there are expensive setup fees and uh, there is insufficient flexibility and the legal restrictions. And for example, uh, the ETF, like actual traded funds that are rather in fashion for the last five years, uh, to manage such a fund, you need to, to spend up to 100K uh, to, for the management fee for the team. And uh, there is a big amount of the money that should be managed for the ETF. And it could be like uh, 200 or $300,000 uh, at least, or even more for the smallest ETF. And in this case, sometimes you just want to invest in some kind of emerging industry as a longevity industry. So you would be interested in more tailored sophisticated portfolio. In this case here, you can um, approach the active managed certificate, which also is issued by the asset manager, which is also both as a scaling factor, but it's rather cost effective. So it could be using like 20 up to 30 Key for the management fees for the manager or even lower and it has uh, uh, less uh, demand for the assets that you need to use for the starter package. Uh, so what is an active demand certificate? Uh, this is a structured security with an underlying asset that is managed on a discretionary basis in accordance with a stated investment strategy throughout the product life cycle. So basically, uh, active demand certificates are issued by investment firms or special purpose vehicles uh, and they synthetically implement their investment strategy through the IMC advisor or an asset manager, which you can see at this picture. So the asset manager forms a portfolio, uh, uses his investment expertise and goes to the IMC issuers Classically, it's investment bank. Uh, the IMC has a ICIN number that is making available for qualified uh, institutional and professional investors. And it can, it can be launched uh, very quickly in a matter of four weeks uh, with a right, wide range of investment strategies and uh, has no issuance exp expenses for the asset manager. And uh, first of all, it's widely uh, known in Switzerland, but now it's uh, becoming more and more popular in other countries, such as, for example, the United Kingdom. 
uh, in this slide, you can see the benefits of the actual managed certificate VS traditional investment fund. Uh, so first of all, the benefits of structured goods and flexible company change within the underlying framework. The investment strategies with low seed money, so sometimes you don't need any minimum requirement to launch the IMC, they can be formed very quickly comparing to the traditional investment funds, the government by prospectus regulations. So the investors, they are not afraid to invest in such instruments and investment strategy can be repacked into an IMC. So a very interesting uh, strategy can be used and only hedge funds can compete with IMCs in such a flexibility. And uh, even embedded leverage and regular coupon payments might be included. So you can make very tailored MC for your clients and it could be a very interesting instrument for your clients for the future. Uh, here is an example for individualization of such an instrument. Uh, it, it can implement the feeder certificate. Uh, which is offering a risk-seeking investor who want to increase the exposure to the underlying investment portfolio. Uh, it is non-resource uh, and can be static or dynamically changed to, to maintain the same level of exposure of the underlying of the portfolio. And a capital protected variant of the MC can be preferred by the conservative investors. So as I've said before, it uh, like unlike the hedge funds, it can be very tailored and it can be very flexible according uh, to the needs of the investors who approach to the decent uh, um, asset manager or wealth management firm. Uh, so here is an example of Deep Knowledge Group IMCs as an example of how you can do it. Uh, recently, Deep Knowledge Group issued uh, two actively managed certificates, such as cancer vaccines actively managed certificate issued with UBS Bank in, U in the United Kingdom, and Ariane Deep Knowledge AI Pharma Index issued in Switzerland with Vantabell and Ariane Capital. Here is an example of the portfolios that you can build using big data analytical systems and other best tech solutions that you can implement. So the basic principles is that uh, an asset management firm or asset manager or analytical agencies, for example, deep pharma intelligence can create a proprietary list of uh, the AI and pharma related public companies. Uh, in our big data analytical system, we create uh, dynamic SWOT analysis uh, to analyze the companies. Uh, we do make fundamental financial analysis. Uh, we do make technological assessment and we deploy the portfolio and optimize it on the regular basis. Uh, here at this uh, slide, you can see uh, the bigger uh, picture of such a portfolio. So here, for example, you can uh, monitor uh, if your portfolio outperforms or underperforms uh, uh, some index on which you can, for example, tailor, for example, uh, here we uh, combine cancer vaccines portfolio and NASDAQ biotechnology index, and we can see that our portfolio outperforms. So in this case, we can understand that we do it good. So here you can also use, for example, S&P 500 or other indexes and uh, such instruments that allow managers to follow their strategy to see if they need to implement meant more uh, portfolio management and uh, they need to rebalance uh, the assets in the portfolio. Uh, so the key features of uh, deep knowledge longevity IMC is that we are going also to issue in the future that could be uh, comp a combination of longevity related companies that for example if you build your own IMC you can also pick the number of the companies it could be like 1,000 or 100,000 at whatever comes uh, to you. Uh, then you can conduct fundamental technical analysis. You can build your own diversified portfolio. Uh, for example, we use advanced AI-driven investment techniques and uh, other techniques can be implemented by the portfolio manager if he wants to issue an IMC. Uh, here you can see uh, different risk reduction, diversification methodology. You can see that is it liquid or not, uh, what are the tax benefits, and so on. Uh, so also our MCs are backed by our 
analytical agencies and, for example, we encourage you to go and uh, read our open access investment analytics, for example, on cancer vaccines or longevity investment or young pharma digest. And also you can use different analytics for your portfolio management. And uh, also we encourage you to try our joint investment big data analytics dashboard, or please share also your experience during our session. We would be very interested. Please write in the chat what our approaches that you use. And uh, we would be very delighted to learn more as well as during our panel session. And uh, as well as uh, Deep Pharma Intelligence big data analytics dashboard allows you to play your own uh, portfolio on AI and pharma companies so to try such features and dynamic SWOT analysis, competitive intelligence to compare different startups and companies to see uh, which one looks better considering your investment strategies, use business and technical due diligence and more approaches that uh, would be very interesting for us to learn what to use uh, at your work. So thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure. And uh, also I would be glad uh, to learn more about the approaches of different investors. Thank you very much, Anastasia, for your incredible insights about AMC. Um, now, I think we will just have a very uh, short break just for uh, two moments. And um, yes, if you just give us two months, and if you could also draw your attention into the chat, you will find again, several links uh, for you to review some details about Anastasia's um, presentation as well, and her, also her profile, um, as well as her LinkedIn profile. Um, and you can follow some of the content that she has also been um, sharing recently, along with articles and news and um, media items that she has been involved in. Um, so yes, we will be back in just uh, two short moments. Thank you. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to now introduce our next keynote speaker, Kojik Saha. He is the CEO and co-CIO of True Risk Capital, an institutional investment researcher, portfolio manager, and trader. It's lovely to have you here with us today. Highlights of Mr. Shasha's, um, sorry, apologies, Kojik, is it Shasha or Shaha? Shaha. Ah. Saha, thank you very much. Um, highlights of Mr. Saha's career include systematic, systematic model development and portfolio management at Barclays Global Investors. He is a past pioneer in scientific investment research, an industry leader in data-driven systematic hybrid investing and active portfolio management. True Risk Capital is a quantitative manager of liquid alternative hedge fund strategies that circumvent the constraints of legacy investment styles in traditional asset classes. The firm's algorithms automate a research-driven systematic approach, which is non-discretionary, in offering clients it for its US equity long short managed futures and equity index option income strategies. Um, Mr. Saha, it's lovely to have you with us today um, and the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Roxy. Pleasure to be here speaking at the Investec uh, Innovations Conference today. Uh, hello to everyone and uh, very thankful to uh, the Deep Knowledge Group for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Kaushik Saha and uh, uh, as Roxy mentioned, I lead up uh, the efforts at True Risk Capital. Uh, True Risk Capital is a quantitative investment manager that's based in Los Angeles uh, in the US. Uh, and uh, our specialty is that we use uh, a systematic approach uh, using uh, machine learning based uh, uh, methods as well as uh, traditional uh, methods in investment finance. Uh, and uh, the highlight is that we take a completely non-discretionary or fully automated approach and let our machines uh, basically make the investment decisions and uh, uh, basically produce uh, investment returns. Uh, so today I'm going to share uh, with you uh, a slide deck that talks about uh, the machine learning methods we use for algorithmic trading for our true risk capital U.S. equity long short strategy. Um, so uh, strategy offering, uh, as I said, we implement a quantitative uh, investment methodology. 
and uh, to build and uh, you know trade and investment uh, strategy there are three parts to it one is uh, the prediction uh, portion of the model where the various uh, signals are uh, basically uh, predicted over a certain time frame. It could be three months, six months, 12 months, uh, using various machine learning methods. And then uh, there is uh, the second step where uh, the outputs of the prediction models are combined to create uh, tradable ideas, whether you want to buy IBM or sell, uh, you know, Google, uh, those sort of decisions. And then we have to do a back test and then a live simulation to determine whether uh, these uh, market calls are profitable. Um, so let's see, next slide. As I mentioned, we focus on US equities with a market cap greater than 1 uh, billion USD. Uh, they belong to the Wilshire 5000 index. We are, have the ability to go either long or short. Uh, proprietary quantitative investment methodology. Our position count is typically 100 securities, 50 long, 50 short. Um, and uh, we rebalance typically every month. And um, of course, as the market moves and the security prices move, we can implement stop losses and so on. We can take profits. So that can be at a faster frequency. And then we have a uh, market bias, plus or minus 15%, depending on which way we think the market might move. We have a trend indicator separate from our machine learning uh, methodology that I'll dive into right now. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we focus on uh, the prediction aspect using our uh, artificial intelligence models. Uh, and then we move on to portfolio selection after the predictive analytics have delivered on uh, their recommendations. And then a uh, portfolio management involves uh, risk management in large part so that there are no uh, imbalances. These are the checks and balances which uh, any uh, market-based system will focus on. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the calls are made uh, in a market neutral um, approach uh, so that there is no bias uh, between the long and short recommendations initially, and then we apply uh, the external bias uh, depending on uh, what our trend indicator tells us. So the prediction layer is based on fundamental data, as you would expect, uh, company uh, you know, ratios, and then alternative data. Um, and so uh, fundamental data, obviously, uh, you'll be familiar with it, involves focusing on in, uh, income statements, balance sheets, cash flow statements, so on and so forth. Uh, and alternative data is a whole host of other things, uh, rel mostly relating to sentiment, market sentiment. Uh, and then uh, we have a portfolio construction layer, which I talked about, a uh, market neutral approach. And uh, as I mentioned, 50 longs, 50 shorts, covers about 3,000 equities. Uh, and then the risk management layer implements a granular stop loss system. So these uh, systems all work hand in hand. And obviously with uh, any system, there's a feedback uh, loop that is self-adapting and self-aware because of this AI-based approach uh, that we take. So a lot of uh, you know, our process is, uh, fits the traditional mold. Like any traditional process, you'll have your data source um, you know, and the market data will be either traditional or alternative. Uh, and then we have the model that is implementing uh, these uh, sophisticated uh, you know, uh, logical decisions uh, based on machine learning methods, which I'll go into next. And then we go back to the traditional approach of execution and monitoring. Uh, so uh, basically, um, this optimizing for prediction accuracy that we take on using our algorithms reduces uh, the bias and variance uh, in supervised learning and uh, basically gives us a chance to convert a family of moderately strong learners into a strong and robust uh, 
uh, one. Um, so uh, the choice of the method we use uh, based on any data set that we focus on depends on the structure of the raw data. And uh, again, there's, you know, we go through a process of uh, cleaning up the data to ensure accuracy before a application. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, the predictive layer of uh, these models, uh, they work in a feedback loop oriented method so that they adapt to changing conditions and adjust uh, in real time. Um, so uh, what are the AI models we use? Uh, the obviously various uh, types of uh, AI models. Uh, there are your typical uh, basic uh, linear uh, AI models, the most uh, fundamental of them being logistic regression. And a lot of this is obviously based on, you know, statistics, uh, comes out of the field of statistics. Then uh, we use linear discriminant analysis, Bayesian regression, and then uh, there are nonlinear AI models, uh, which, uh, you know, allows for changing of, um, you know, the parameters as and when the underlying uh, data changes. Uh, and uh, so we have k-nearest neighbors, random forest regression, uh, and uh, support vector machines. And then advanced nonlinear AI models. Um, and again, these are growing, and it even includes, uh, you know, uh, genetic evolution algorithms, which I've not put down here. Uh, so it's a long laundry list. And so we have uh, built our libraries of these uh, proprietary, our own proprietary uh, implementations of these uh, various approaches in machine learning and we apply them to our data. So the first stage of evaluation in this predictive uh, um, phase involves 65 unique fundamental factors and ratios across uh, two uh, time scales, uh, daily and quarterly. And um, so uh, we then uh, create a subset based on this first stage of evaluation where in a second stage, we apply uh, 20 unique technical metrics for an equity. So each equity of the, you know, each of the 3,000 equities that we're uh, evaluating, we'll apply typically in our second stage 20 unique technical metrics uh, using, um, you know, um, optimal entry and exit points for each position. Uh, so, you know, with every sort of, uh, um, change in day-to-day uh, -day price, we will reevaluate uh, all these metrics all over again. Uh, so third stage of evaluation utilizes price predictions of three months, six months, and 12 months for each equity, as well as volatility predictions using the same time, uh, uh, time scales. So that's how we narrow it down uh, to our uh, selection subset. Uh, next up, we, uh, after the initial evaluation phase, um, there are a large amount of equities not suitable for investment in the current time. And uh, so uh, we discard them and uh, we then uh, basically focus on our proprietary C-score system, uh, which is basically a core value driver of alpha generation. So this C-score system uh, looks at the risk reward profile given all the signal inputs that it has received and then generates uh, the buy and sell decisions uh, for each of the selected securities in our prediction layer. Uh, so the C-score system uh, opt is designed to optimize sector exposures, both on the long and short side, uh, and is basically the core driver of our returns. Um, so uh, this is essentially what goes into creating, uh, you know, our robust uh, portfolio, uh, you know, that we either recommend to investors or implement ourselves. So um, I won't, really dive into 
you know, the C-score system because time is short. But what we do is we maintain uh, tight stop losses uh, in all environments uh, so that our investment methodology and our, uh, you know, investment guidelines are adhered to. Um, and we maintain these stop losses uh, at a bracket level, which is for a group of equities, typically a sector, and at the portfolio uh, level. Um, and and, and uh, so that's essentially uh, you know, key to maintaining uh, the risk management that we promise our investors. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, the Cisco system focuses on sectors for our individual picks. Uh, and we keep the sectors also within bounds. Um, and by varying the sector exposures across a large array of industries, we are able to position ourselves flexibly, fle with flexibility and uh, also favorably to benefit from you know, various positive and negative trends uh, impacting the sectors and industries. Uh, so we try and make alpha on the positive side, and we separately try and make alpha on the negative side, and one is not typically used to hedge uh, the other. So let's take a quick look on how, uh, you know, a live implementation of the strategy uh, uh, performed. So we have a client, Crimson Black Capital uh, of the UK, and they uh, basically uh, utilize our model and uh, um, was able to uh, come off uh, profitably uh, through the 2020 COVID crash. Uh, so uh, the monthly return for Crimson Black Capital for Jan, Feb, and March were roughly 15%, 5%, and 7% versus the S&P that saw pretty large drawdowns. Um, and uh, the reason for the outperformance um, around uh, this time of uh, COVID is because with greater market volatility and dislocation, there's a greater dispersion uh, among the various securities in the universe. And so there's a greater potential uh, to monetize uh, profits uh, that are there for the taking if the model works correctly. Uh, and so that's uh, what uh, we sort of uh, uh, were able to establish, um, and this is uh, you know the performance of the model over the twelve months uh, around uh, the COVID time frame. And see, you'll notice that in the months leading up to COVID, um, when the market was relatively stable, the model is not able to uh, produce outsized performance. And uh, the three months leading uh, you know into COVID and out of COVID, we saw uh, the three bars that, you know, produced the bulk of the returns. Uh, and uh, so uh, we basically uh, go through an iterative process of reviewing uh, on a quarterly basis uh, to basically figure out if, uh, you know, these algos are uh, doing their job uh, on a signal by signal basis. Uh, and um, basically, we try to keep uh, these models honest and, uh, you know, uh, make sure that uh, uh, they are, in fact, adapting uh, correctly and making the right decisions. So I'll, I'll conclude with that by saying that, um, you know, uh, U.S. equity long short is one of the th uh, several strategies uh, we offer. Another one being a managed future strategy that is trend-based on the S&P 500. And we have a volatility income strategy. And for those interested, uh, they can uh, contact uh, me at uh, this number provided an email. Our website is uh, truriskcapital.com. And uh, yeah, um, you know, we are happy to take questions offline, uh, if not uh, later on. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kaushik, for that um, really insightful presentation. Um, there, I can see several questions already that have come through in Q&A, which we will try to um, get through during the panel. Otherwise, you have the opportunity to respond directly uh, if there are very specific questions that only you would be able to answer. So moving on um, to our next um, keynote speaker, we have 
Talgat Takia, the Head of Investor Relations at Longevity Financial Advisors. Talgat is a financial professional with deep expertise in investor relations, corporate management and business development strategy. Prior to joining, he had worked for asset management companies and family offices in the UK and also in Switzerland, and also an investment banking boutique in New York. Talgat holds a master's degree in management from Imperial College Business School as well. Talgat, it's lovely to meet you and I'm very much looking forward lovely to Lovely to meet you. Roxy, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to speak today. And uh, today is a topic uh, of my presentation is uh, commoditization of uh, biotech and the deep tech. Commoditization of deep tech and biotech in the global marketplace. Let's start with the common overall uh, ground of where we are at the moment. Uh, so uh, tech is entering a new era and it's truly so, as you can see straight away from uh, the table, from uh, 1990, the NASDAQ Composite Dynamics has been rising steadily, but between 2010, 2020, you see a rapid growth in value. Actually on the NASDAQ along the last decade, it has created 16 trillion in value. And uh, the primary cause of that was enterprise cloud and consumer internet solutions. And uh, for the past uh, 10 years, the rise uh, has been enormous, I would say. And it's because uh, uh, the period of, uh, from launching and to generating a commercial success has become uh, smaller because uh, there are more and more companies getting to the market. And so we see a rapid rise. And especially it will be a case with deep tech because uh, in the next couple of years, deep tech will uh, give birth to many new companies, many new breakthrough solutions. And uh, we'll see a, a similar growth, I would say, that happened between 2010, 2020. I would say we will see at least similar growth between 2020 and 2030. Uh, everyone knows uh, BioNTech, especially after the COVID period. And uh, here I would like to show you the success of BioNTech. The company actually was founded uh, long before in 2008. It's a German biotechnology company that develops pharmaceuticals candidates based on messenger ribonic asset for use as individualized cancer immunotherapies. And the company raised 150 million uh, during the NASDAQ IPO and listed at a market capitalization of 3.5 billion sequentially increasing to 7.5 billion in early 2020. And look at this staggering peak it reached in uh, 2021, 113 billion in August. Subsequently, actually, it has declined as well. Uh, quite rapidly to 40 billion, but uh, I guess it was the this rise was probably because uh, it happened during the peak of the pandemic, and uh, now that the world has already uh, come down and uh, I would say came back to normal from the post-COVID situation, so the market capitalization of the company uh, went down. But as, as you can see, the company had a quite, I would say, during this smaller period, it had a quite a staggering rise. So this is what we see with the in, uh, biotech uh, and deep tech companies these days. So the, uh, what we can see here actually is how they can rapidly create uh, this uh, huge capitalizations and can affect markets. Uh, let's see the numbers of the combined value of European founded deep tech companies. As you can see, between 2010 and 2021, we had a huge uprise from uh, 143 billion to 845 billion in just 10 years, which is quite a small period uh, in uh, the business world, but uh, 
as I have already stated, the deep tech and the biotech uh, industries, they move really, really quickly nowadays. Uh, actually, on the bottom of the slide, you can see notable deep tech companies that uh, were created since 2000 and uh, before 2000. Some of these companies are household names and some of them you know very well. Uh, let's talk about Europe. In Europe's top academic institutions, there is actual untapped potential because deep tech companies in Europe are now worth a total of more than 800 billion euros, as we've seen in the previous slide. Many have academic backgrounds and received early funding from the government. And universities and research in Europe are truly world class. As we know, like one of the best academies in the world are located in Europe which actually helps uh, to develop deep tech in the, on the continent. And to support Europe's most promising deep tech startups, closer collaboration is necessary. Some of the most successful businesses will be able to break down barriers by integrating disciplines and attracting a diverse range of talent and investors at various stages of development. And to assist such companies prosper and scale, universities, governments, specialized deep tech investors, and venture capital investors should collaborate more closely. And the third the point is bottom-up streamlining and top-down strategic thinking are required in the coming decade. And biotech's success demonstrates that the early government university support truly uh, helps to truly recruit Europe's finest talents. And such initiatives must be streamlined from bottom to up. And meanwhile, Europe may benefit from imitating some of US and China's large-scale long-term strategic R&D techniques. Uh, let's actually look at the cash burn in different types of startups. This uh, very interesting slide. So uh, from your left, you can see a regular startup cash burn from the seed stage to early and late stages. And uh, most of the regular startups, they utilize cutting edge, but proven technology. And uh, successful startups can confirm product market fit as soon as possible. And uh, patents and R&D are uncommon. This is why they can get to the market uh, much quicker and actually deep tech startups and biotech startups. With deep tech startups, uh, they have lengthy R&D phase. As you can see, they have to test so multiple times their products. And uh, they also need a greater proportion of technical personnel, which is not easy to find. And hardware IP are frequently used. Uh, at the same time, discovery phase is getting shorter and market risks are lower with biotech startups. Uh, let's see what uh, the industry needs to accelerate this progress. Uh, first is breeding ground universities. Universities are birthplace of many deep tech enterprises in which universities hold equity and royalties. Government sponsorship is also very important. There are multiple initiatives right now, especially in Europe, like Horizon Europe, seven year uh, US research and innovation funding program with uh, quite a big budget of 100 billion euros. Uh, corporations uh, invest capital in deep tech and biotech research and development. And uh, this amount of 150 billion actually represents the yearly uh, European business R&D expenditure to enable uh, growth and sure bright future. And uh, in terms of venture investments, uh, 10 billion euros per year. So deep tech startups receive almost a quarter of VC funding in Europe. Uh, and this number almost tripled in the last five years, which shows us that uh, investors, special private investors, see deep tech and biotech as the next big thing and uh, they take advantage of the contemporary market opportunities and they support early stage technology to uncover breakthroughs and then advance the ecosystem. Uh, it's also possible that deep tech startups have higher chances for exit. If you can see uh, from the table on your right side, uh, in the middle tech startups, uh, they have uh, 15% of chance on the round fifth. Uh, and the biotech uh, startups have approximately similar 
chances, but deep tech has 17% chances, uh, which is great. And deep tech startups, uh, startups uh, the technology, they provide attractive acquisition target for companies with existing large data sets or virtually unlimited capital to incur losses. And there have been several notable exits. And uh, from uh, on the left side, you can see some deep tech companies, maybe you heard about them, and you can see a deal description, the activity. And uh, as you can see, uh, for example, with uh, uh, the first company acquired by Meta for $100 million in 2022. Uh, and the, like, as you can see, the acquisition amounts are quite big. So which tells us that uh, deep tech and uh, biotech uh, startups are progressing real well. They're getting uh, noticed by big companies. And uh, these kind of uh, examples uh, can stimulate uh, many more potential engineers and uh, biotech founders uh, to get to the market. Deep tech funding in Europe hit record heights in uh, 2021. Yes, as you can see, uh, during the last five years, the rise has been quite staggering from 5 billion in uh, 2016 to 19 billion to 2021, more than two times. And uh, this, yes, this is more than double. And uh, on your left side, you can see notable deep tech investors by capital employed, uh, deployed in Europe. This is actually are household names which again shows that uh, big venture funds like uh, Balderton Capital, which are quite big in London, SoftBank, Index Ventures, and they uh, invest heavily in deep tech and biotech. And uh, this shows us that uh, we are already at the stage of the uh, rapid commoditization of the industries. Uh, let's see uh, venture capital investments in deep deep tech by destination. Uh, first, let's see US. Actually, 2021 was a bit uh, smaller than the previous year, 2020. Uh, again, it uh, might be connected to the uh, challenge in the last couple of years. But as we can see, US is a major investor in the industry. Uh, Europe is less, 20 billion, 2021 and the projected amount will be 22. Uh, it is smaller than US, but if you actually look at the trend, it's definitely rising and uh, rising quite fast. And uh, China also invests uh, similar amounts to Europe, I would say. And But at the moment, government uh, started more programs to increase its investment. And uh, it is said to be investing $10 billion in quantum computing and artificial intelligence center. So as we can see uh, in terms of destinations, Europe and China are quite on the same level, but US are definitely ahead at the moment. Europe is a powerful science hub. Yes, this is true. If you can see uh, the statistics, highly scientific publications by regions, Europe are well ahead. Uh, second comes China, and the third comes U.S. China and U.S. actually have a similar statistics, and the U.K. is 10%. And uh, definitely, if you, uh, Europe and U.K. are well ahead of other uh, destinations. And top five countries by number of uh, STEM graduates per 1,000 inhabitants, if you can see uh, all the European countries. Ireland is a leading hub of uh, graduates in uh, STEM. Yes, and uh, to conclude, uh, it's time to build an effective deep tech strategy, which is important for important for the whole ecosystem, important for investors, uh, and important for startups to be on one page and to have a common focus. So curing uh, diseases, improving healthcare will definitely get much and much important. Food security, uh, global warming, and industry transformation. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, 
to have a successful deep strategy, deep tech strategy, must focus not only on technology, but also on a commercial success or creating product that people will actually want to use. And deep tech startups have the potential to solve global challenges by utilizing technologies with such enormous transformational power, which you already saw with the success of bio and tech during the COVID area. And we'll see many, many more examples. This is the last slide of my presentations. I hope you liked it and I would be happy to answer possible questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tal. I think we more than liked it. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And Thank you, Roxy. Thank you, everyone. For sure, it, it will be included in the recording afterwards as well. So we have Anne Liebgo, um, and she is the founder and managing director at AW Switzerland, and she will present her informative views on international investment diversification made in Switzerland. Anne is a Swiss, Canadian and Danish national, and she is the founder and managing director of the award winning Swiss online platform, um, AW Switzerland, and um, AWS introduces Swiss asset managers that have registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States and are dedicated to providing Swiss wealth management services to US and Canadian citizens, residents and expats. The platform includes other wealth management related services as well, in addition, and provides North American orientated marketing, communication and business development strategies through her agency, um, Americom in Switzerland. Um, and it's a pleasure to have you uh, join us. I have to ask, is that a very good Zoom background you have or is this an empty This is location? actually, uh, let's call it my home office view on the island of Mallorca. <laughs> <laughs> you are living your best. Uh, I just life. came back We're from a ending. long, typical <laughs> Spanish lunch. <laughs> Amazing. Well deserved, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm heading back to Switzerland on Friday. And in uh, Switzerland, I also have an excellent view. I'll have to show you that the next time. Uh, but this is my vista <laughs> uh, here in Mallorca. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for um, joining us today. And I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Anne Liebgott. I uh, am founder and I run the internet platform, award-winning, like you mentioned. It's at americanswelcome.swiss. Basically, it's a platform that builds a bridge between US and Canadian investors uh, who want to hold a portion of their assets in Switzerland. And it's not always an easy uh, task to find out who to contact, who to get in touch with, which wealth manager should I use and so on and so forth. And this platform provides exactly that. It provides exactly the, that bridge between the two. And um, it's like, like I said, easy to access 24 um, seven, no sign in requirements, uh, no sponsorships, no Google ads, no anything. So if you visit the platform, uh, you don't get bombarded by any kind of creepy Google ads and stuff like that. It's just really a useful tool, a useful resource uh, for Americans and Canadians that would like to get established in Switzerland. So the next question has also been, um, what what kind of investments are very popular in Switzerland these days? Well, okay, I have just roll back a little bit. Switzerland has been recognized as the most resilient country in the world to handle the aftermath of the pandemania and so on. And now we have other issues that have come to, in addition to that. Inflation, for example, where in Europe today, I read, a, I read a line that it said that a European inflation is at 8.2%. In Switzerland, we have basically 2.2% inflation. In some areas, maybe 4%, like in, uh, in, in um, gasoline and so on. But you know, inflation in Switzerland is not really an issue. So if you're, for example, wanting to preserve the value of your investments, the value of your currencies and so on, the Swiss franc once again <laughs> proves to be a stable value. And um, I mean, I know this is a deep tech 
platform, and I'm not so deep tech myself, but um, this platform is a is a online way to find out how to get established in Switzerland. Now, of course, we have um, Crypto Valley that's in Zug in, in Switzerland, for example. And even though there's been a in crypto, um, it's still going strong. Um, the Swiss government or the Swiss best 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 said the Swiss financial authorities have already departed their legislation on uh, cryptocurrencies and fintech and um, all these kind of things. So we're in a very, very safe ground as far as that's concerned. And then again, Switzerland has always been, has always been a resort for, uh, let's say, wealth preservation. When crisis comes in the world, no matter what, no matter where, it can be a world war, it can be something else, it can be pandemania, it can be something else, and so on. Uh, Switzerland has, has really been the place to be for cross-border private wealth management. And that has many reasons. Of course, the stability of Switzerland is, you know, economic and political stability is a main reason. Um, neutrality, even though, even though now with the war with Ukraine, Switzerland has, I don't want to say compromise in their neutrality because the neutrality always means we do not take up armed war against another, com uh, another country. And in this case, Switzerland did decide to um, adopt the worldwide sanctions against Russians uh, for this um, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but it's neutrality in the sense of that it does not provide weapons. It does not um, uh, send troops. It does not engage in warfare with um, another sovereignty in times of war. That remains. And on the other hand, we also have just the professionalism of the Swiss Financial Center. And that, I mean, like I said, it, there wouldn't be a reason why it's not from Fitch uh, AAA rated with a strong outlook. Uh, Switzerland is always, again, um, mentioned as a leading uh, jurisdiction for private Swiss wealth management. And uh, yeah, the clients that are invested in Switzerland are generally <laughs> uh, very happy with the services. Um, especially for Americans, which my platform deals with, actually, it deals with Americans uh, wanting to invest or North Americans wanting to invest in Switzerland. Um, you know, after the, after the tax evasion issues would go back like to 2008 and so on, where, where Switzerland was actually became uh, world famous, um, not just for their numbered accounts, but for their capability of helping uh, US persons to um, let's just call it uh, strongly optimize their, their tax relations by um, constructing various um, struct, yeah, structuring, structuring um, using other jurisdictions like the Cayman Islands and so forth and so on. Uh, to kind of protect their assets from any kind of taxation. Now, that blew up in the face of UBS at the time. They were the initiator of the whole thing. But since then, and this is, goes more than 10 years ago, since then, Switzerland has adopted a strict white money policy. And the Swiss wealth managers that are registered with the SEC in the United States and are able to provide their services to U.S. clients they do not accept any funds that are not officially declared. So that's just one thing. Um, on the other hand, a Swiss SEC registered investment advisor has an international perspective. That's their upbringing, that's their education. So they um, do not hesitate to say, come on, let's let's diversify a portfolio internationally to take advantage of, uh, you know, this market and that market, this investment and that investment, and so on. 
they're not bound uh, by, you know, working with um, Charles Schwab or or another another bank that that wants to sell their so-called globally diversified portfolios in Switzerland. You actually get the real thing. It is truly globally diversified in the sense that you yourself hold these shares of these companies and so forth. So that being said, um, this idea of investing in Switzerland is not just for Americans and it's not just for Canadians either. It's, it's basically for um, members you know, around the world. And we do see a lot of investing coming from Asia or from the Middle East or from um, Eastern Europe. Um, Russia was, still is actually an um, interesting client base, but of course in Switzerland now with the sanctions on, um, the Russians are kind of like um, <laughs> persona non grata. Everything is on hold and they'll just keep it that way for the time being. So why would you invest in Switzerland other than the economic on political stability and um, other than uh, maybe the special expertise that Swiss wealth managers have. Well, of course you have the Swiss franc, which is a the currency in times of crisis. It's historically the world's strongest currency. So if you're talking about inflation wo woes, uh, the Swiss franc can be very helpful. In, in, in hedging inflation and woes that you might have, like for example, in the United States. And um, sometimes when you think of global mobility, if you hold assets outside of your home country, uh, and let's say you need to access assets outside of your whole home country, uh, even if it's just by, by credit card or you want to get some cash or you want to do some investing or whatever the case may be, holding assets outside of your own jurisdiction enables you to do that. So just let's say, um, I'll give an example for Canada. Uh, Canada during the pandemania, the prime minister Trudeau uh, was upset with the Canadian truckers um, demonstrating against having to deal with these COVID um, regulations. And so he decided to freeze their accounts, just like that. No warning given and their accounts were frozen. Now that might be for a trucker in Canada, uh, not such a big deal, but just think how it can happen to anybody at any time. And if you have some assets in Switzerland, then you can always access them no matter what happens in your home country. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, your, your retirement pension funds can be annexed and they can be shut down. You can have your, you know, accounts shut down. You can have international transfers shut down, whatever the case may be. But if you're holding some assets in Switzerland, then you actually can, um, you know, access those funds at any time. And that is actually for a lot of um, wealthy and ultra wealthy individuals. It's like their plan B. The same goes for citizenship and residence planning. Um, for example, in the United States, it's been reported that there's been a 260% increase in interest in second uh, citizenships and residencies uh, from North Americans and South Americans as well, because uh, they have seen that uh, they don't want to be locked in. A lockdown is one thing, being locked in is a little bit of another thing. And these uh, people have realized that it is very beneficial to have an alternative to just your home base and just where you're living and your banking situation there and your living situation there and so on. So that's another point that has been you know, added to the whole idea of global diversification or what you can call it international diversification of your assets. It's not only your assets anymore these days, it's also the ability to move around and so on. So next, let's come, here comes the next generation. We're talking about millennials or generation Z and so on. Um, let's say the older investors, you know, around 60 plus at this point in time, 
Um, they stand in the next few years to transfer their wealth to the next generation. And the next generation, they are, of course, um, due to growing up with the internet and so on and so forth, they are more attuned to the idea of living abroad, traveling abroad, spending time abroad, spending some years abroad. Um, for them, you know, international wealth management is not that far away. They don't have to go to their local wealth manager. They know that they can go everywhere in the world. They can go to Asia or they can go to London or they can even go to Switzerland, for example and they can have their funds managed there. So that being said, Switzerland is open to everybody. And in the past, it was difficult for an American, for example, to establish an account in Switzerland, um, coming off the tax evasion issues from way back when. And by now, there are many Swiss SEC registered investment advisors um, that have registered with the SEC in specifically to be able to serve U.S. clients. Uh, many of them are affiliated with bigger banks like Fontobel and uh, Piquet and um, UBS, actually. And others are larger independent wealth managers um, serving U.S. clients. Some of them also serve Canadian clients. And then you get down to like the one man show, um, which can offer a very personal service. They usually don't have that many clients and that many accounts to deal with. So they can offer a real personal one to one, any day, every day kind of relationship. And that is, um, can be beneficial or can be preferred by American investors, especially because they are used to being just a number with their wealth manager in the US or in, or in Canada, for example. So the question is, why would you want to invest a portion of your assets in Switzerland? I mean, there's reporting requirements. You have to report your Finance, foreign financial account in the so-called FBAR reporting. You have to do this and you have to do that. But those, all those um, reporting requirements are very, very clear cut. It's basically just a little bit of you know, paperwork to be filed and you know, otherwise you're done with that. It's not, there's not really any you know, back and forth and back and forth issues about that. So that makes, that makes it very easy in itself. And um, that's why in times of crisis, like we can say we have now, and maybe they will increase as, as time passes in the next few months or so, when they talk about third world wars and uh, nuclear attacks, and I don't know what, it just makes sense to hold a portion of one's assets in another jurisdiction. And Switzerland has been like the place to be for centuries. This doesn't just uh, have to do with uh, holding equities and so on. This can also do with um, holding physical gold or physical precious metals. It can also do with having a private placement life insurance policy in place, where which basically acts as a trust, for example, where you um, can determine the beneficiaries uh, without probate, etc. And in this time, uh, it's comforting for many to know that they can organize themselves in advance before any calamities really show up on the horizon so that when something does happen, um, they're actually set up properly. And that's a very important feature, I think, because um, so many people suffer by not being prepared simply not being prepared. I mean, not that they're ignorant of the subject or not that they don't know what that should be done. They just haven't got around to it yet. And that's where um, it's important that you have a resource like Americans Welcome Swiss 
if you have a resource that you can find these people, which will enable you to be prepared for what is needed in the future. And children or grandchildren will be very, very grateful for that when they find out about it. A lot of times this information is not shared in advance. It's only shared after uh, the patriarch passes away or matriarch these days passes away. And uh, actually it should be an open discussion beforehand. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are hesitant to do that for some particular reason. Um, you know, everybody's different. Everybody has their own preferences and so on. And um, I just think it's important that you're prepared for the future, that you do what you can at this point in time to mitigate um, risks and problems that may come, especially in the volatility that we have. Thank you very much, Anne, for your presentation. Um, and it, it was extremely insightful. And I'm, I'm quite keen to um, touch upon some of the, the key points um, from your presentation um, during the panel session, which will be quite soon. Okay, so now I would like to move on and um, introduce our final speaker for today before we join our um, panelists. Um, our speaker is Alpesh Doshi. I think you are with us right now, aren't you, Alpesh? Lovely. Um, Alpesh is the founder and CEO of Fintricity and Kendra Labs. Hi, Alpesh. Um, his company was founded in 2001, and it has been at the forefront of big data, technology, and digital transformation for over 15 years. Entrepreneurs at heart, their team takes a business-first approach to match the right blend of solutions and technology to solve their clients' specific business and IT challenges. Alpesh, it's a pleasure to have you join us today, and I'll... Th thanks a lot, Roxy, for the intro. Um, it's a bit grand. Didn't mean to be that grand. Um, I'm going to keep my, my presentation fairly short, but um, what I was going to talk about was around sustainability and really around um, sustainability in ESG and uh, getting companies to net zero. And I think, you know, everybody knows what's going on in the market. Hopefully all of you have heard about COP26 and COP27, which is coming up in Egypt in, uh, in September, October, September, September. Um, and what I wanted to briefly go through was just about the challenges that, that companies are having. So as I'm sure, uh, you know, um, on the previous, uh, and in the previous conversations talking about investment, you know, one of the things that we're seeing around investors is investors are looking for impact investments. They're looking to find genuine, no greenwashing impact investments. And that's a really hard challenge at the moment. But there's a large amount of uh, ca uh, cash around from institutional investors, from pension funds, from family offices, um, all looking for um, investment, investing into uh, sustainability and ESG uh, companies. Now, what I'm going to talk about is the challenges around these companies, whether it's a, a bank or a financial institution uh, who is trying to measure uh, and, and create ESG type products and also um, issue uh, debt or, or equity or loans or whatever else based upon ESG principles. And on the other side, the corporates who are all trying to um, actually figure out what their emissions look like. So um, get, Roxy mentioned here on my background, just to tell you a little bit about background and why it comes from. So what we're seeing is um, I got into the sustainability space about two and a bit years ago. And what I realized going through the, going through the work that we've been doing is that it's a data problem. So sustainability is a data problem. If you don't understand the data and you can't actually measure your emissions, then frankly, you know, you don't even know where you are. And most companies are not really bad at that at the moment. And that's because companies are complicated and complex and companies are uh, trying to figure out how they're going to do it. Companies are just at the beginning of their strategies. Some companies have actually, some companies have actually um, um, put KPIs on board to actually reduce emissions. So one of the companies that we're dealing with, a big global financial services firm, they put KPIs. They put KPIs saying, you need to reduce emissions in your department, in your area, and measure it by X percent per year. Uh, and then obviously there's a whole bunch of budget around that. So, you know, the business problem that we're, that we're seeing overall is that all enterprises, almost all enterprises, whether it's voluntary 
um, for smaller companies or large companies, frankly, having to do it from a reporting perspective. And I'll talk about some of the regulation that, that's coming through. Um, smaller companies, younger companies, you know, all the millennials and companies who are, you know, people who are under 30 years old, they actually just want to do it. They want to be, want to be seen to do it. And these entrepreneurs are embracing that to, to help, help them sell, help measure, help get to net zero. And the way to do it is you need a bunch of data. You need to bring that data together from within your business, but also from your supply chain, from your suppliers, but also from third-party data sources. You have to bring all of that data together to be able to work out actually what your emissions look like. Uh, and so the important thing is bringing all this data together and there's a bunch of modeling. So one of the areas that you have to do is what's called transition planning, which is how do you actually get to net zero? So if you asked every company out there and said, oh, we want to get to net zero by 2030, so many companies have declared targets. And if you dig into that and ask them, okay, well, how are you going to do it? Very few of them have any idea. It's fairly qualitative. It's fairly high level. Yes, we're going to reduce, you know, emissions by buying electric cars, or we're going to, you know, we're going to um, buy uh, renewable energy and electricity and that kind of stuff. That's what people have been doing. And, and absolutely, they are, these are elements of it, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily everything. So the market problem that we're seeing is that to come, every company has to measure and plan to reduce to net zero their carbon emissions. And they have to report that to regulators. The EU has regulation called TCFD and SFDI if you're an asset manager. And, and, you need, and you know, they need to enable the ability to make the decisions on how to do that. It's not just a reporting problem. So it's not just about saying, let's aggregate all the data and the challenge is where is the data coming from? It's also about how, what does that data mean? How do you apply it to a model to understand what those emissions are? And how do you actually then figure out what you're going to do to reduce them? So a very simple example, actually calculating emissions in the IT department is a really complex problem. Because if you have a large organization that has tens of data centers, they have, they have, excuse me, they have lots of servers, tens of thousands of servers, they use cloud services, actually getting all the data to understand what those emissions are is a complex problem. So one of the, one of the things is you, if you buy Dell servers or HP servers, or you use the cloud, actually getting that data and understanding what's called embodied carbon, which is how much carbon was emitted on creating that product. Like if you had a Dell server, what was the carbon emissions from creating that server? And, and you have complex processes. So if you're getting data from multiple different systems, you have to wire those things together. I mean, it just doesn't happen simply. You know, there's a lot of different areas where data sits. And as I'm sure some of you, most of you, all of you know, data is a big problem in most companies. They haven't solved this problem around using data in their businesses. So this is just an, another problem that they have to figure out. Regulations coming in. So I mentioned TCFD. Uh, I won't go what, the, what these things mean because it takes too long. But there's a whole bunch of regulation. I'll talk about some of the regulation. The primary thing to remember around regulation is that companies and financial institutions have to do it. If they don't, they get fined. Or if they're not audited, the auditor won't pass their accounts. So starting 2024, auditors are going to go in and one of the elements they're going to audit is the carbon. And being able to prove the data and where it came from to calculate anything is now going to be uh, obligatory. So a lot of what a lot of companies have been doing in the past is just sort of estimations in spreadsheets and saying these are what we think our emissions are. And they've produced these sustainability reports. If, I'm sure you know if you go to any company any large company's website, you'll find their sustainability report, which is fairly qualitative. There's no quantitative data there necessarily. So most companies haven't really done that yet. And therefore, and therefore, you know, they've got a big problem because they've got to do it. They've got no choice but to do it in the next, um, in the next uh, few years. And these things take time. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, it takes time to actually pull the data together. And lack of data just doesn't allow people to make the right decisions. So if you have, for, I go back to the Dell server uh, example, if you buy hundred million dollars worth of Dell servers and you re re replace them with lower carbon ones, how do I know which ones to buy? How do I know over what period of time I need to spend that hundred million to, try, you know, to go from high energy consumption servers to low energy consumption servers or configure them? You need to figure that out. Um, the other area is around um, getting real data from your suppliers. So one of the things that you have to do as an enterprise is you have to bring data from third parties because that counts towards your emissions and you have to report that, which is called scope three. 
And that's a really big problem. If you imagine all your suppliers, if you imagine company suppliers, there's tens, hundreds, if not thousands of suppliers. How do you get the data from all of them? Not, not just qualitative questioning. So some companies out there just answer 50 questions and say, well, it's a qualitative answer. That, that's not good enough anymore. You know, they have to have real data to prove that. Um, and then finally, what we're seeing is the ability to build a sustainability application. So it's not, so, um, oh, and- I have to get back to the and, panel discussion in case there's something going on. And can you put yourself on mute? And, ah, there we go. <laughs> and so what do enterprises need? You know, they need auditable data collection. So they need to show where the data came from, they need to show the lineage of data. So if you changed an emission factor or you changed a calculation or you changed a piece of data, you have to show why it was changed and prove that what's called the lineage, which is what are the steps it went through and how was it changed as it went through those steps. The modeling, planning and decisioning is actually quite complex. So I mentioned the IT example where if you've got a large company with a large estate, actually we're going to figure out how you're going to re reduce those emissions um, and one of the companies that we're working with, you know, they've committed in the IT department to, to reduce emissions by 4% per year over the next five or six years, right? And how do they make those decisions? They've got to plan it out. They've got CapEx spends so that potentially have to spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars over the next few years. So they have to be able to do that. And finally, the regulatory reporting has to happen. So the, the IT department will have to do this and all, similar to all the other departments, so procurement and supply chain and a bunch of others, they all have to do it. If you're a company with industrial, uh, industrial you know, factories, just imagine trying to figure out in all of your factories around the world, how the hell do you collect all the data to actually really understand what those emissions look like? So as another use case, you know, a lot of countries um, have carbon credits. So you have to buy carbon credits if you're polluting the atmosphere. So in the EU, there's a bunch of different uh, regulation around that, and you have to buy carbon credits. So far, there hasn't need to be proven, but actually it, it will need to be proven as we go forward. So what does it really do? I mean, you're basically being able to control data allows you to have better control and visibility. Control and visibility is one of the biggest things that people need to do. Without that, you're blind, right? You need accuracy and completeness because you have to report the accurate number if you went and talked to any enterprise and say, you told us these were emissions, prove where it came from. They wouldn't be able to tell you. And finally, you have to meet the regulatory needs uh, of the market, but also brand perception. So the challenge is, as I'm sure you know, in fashion, for example, it's known to be a big polluter. And you know, if you buy, if you buy a cotton t-shirt, how much water was used to make that cotton t-shirt is well known that you know, huge amounts of water is used to to take cotton and create into a t-shirt. Uh, you know, people are, don't want to buy those kind of clothing anymore, right? And when you finish with it, where does it go? How does it recycle? How is it reused? So it's gone from just being a sort of thing we need to do um, every year. We need to produce a mutual report for marketing purposes and maybe some investor relations to a, 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 one of the key parts of a business where investors, regulators, customers all want to know exactly what you're doing. So I'm going to touch a little bit on regulatory reporting. So, you know, there's a, actually large numbers of regulatory reporting that's done. Um, on the left-hand side, you're talking about some regular reporting. TCFD, I mentioned briefly already, that's an EU regulation that any company over 350 employees and I think it's 30 million euro of revenue have to do. But even the smaller companies are doing it. You know, if you're a fashion brand, going back to the fashion question, if you're creating sustainable T-shirts, you want to prove that you create accessible shoes, even if you are 10 people, where you get, where do you get the material from? How is it made, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also something called science-based targets. Science-based targets, quite interesting one is, you know, how does your com company commit to reducing emissions um, in line with the 1.5 degree target, which is government, what, what the target is globally to do that. And a lot of companies, thousands of companies committed to these science-based targets. If you go to science-based targets on the web, you'll find, find what they talk about. And, um, and there's lots of others. There's lots of regulation in different, um, in, in different um, sectors. So fashion, I mentioned to you, in financial services, ESG investing is a big one. So all these companies are being pressured by their investors. And actually, 
this the uh, banks and financial institutions are seeing it as a commercial opportunity to create in quotes ESG products or ESG funds. Um, the reality is, if you go and ask them, okay, well, how are these composed? They don't necessarily know. Um, there's a question for Manish. I'll, I'll take it at the end if you don't mind, Manish. Um, the the on the other side, you know, with the same data, once you've collected the data, you can do a whole bunch of operational reporting. You can create investment portfolio strategies based upon carbon data. If you bring third party data in, which is one of the things you need to do, you know, it's a combination of internal and external data, government data, et cetera. You're bringing all that together and run AI modeling. So transition planning can be quite complex. So being able to actually run those models, understand what the transition planning effects are to your business, what the risk is, what is the enterprise risk to your business? All these things become pretty important. If you have the data, you can then feed that into the same data, if you like, that that's what we call a system of record. That data is stored in a single carbon data platform. And that what's up, then you can feed that into multiple different areas. So being able to report is only a side effect. General reporting only happens once a year. Moving away from just doing once year reporting to actually operational decisioning, which is what I call it, is a really big factor that, that we're seeing that companies are starting to do. So what, you know, what are the applications? Once you have the data sorted, you know, what can you do with it? And these are some of the things, I'm not gonna read them out, but, but you can see you know, sourcing raw materials and understanding the carbon footprint of a steel frame, of one type of steel frame, for example, to another type of steel frame. You know, which companies are making decisions saying, well, we're gonna buy the one with lower carbon. It may cost more, but actually overall, it's gonna be cheap, cheaper for us if we use, um, if we use that. Um, things that circular economy understanding the circular element of the product that you have whether it's a cup like this one or or a computer like this one you know or a phone sorry a phone is a computer so that one you know this is a very complex supply chain being able to understand how this product was created is actually quite a complex task if you have the data you can work it out you know i'm pretty sure apple will be doing that you know um things like transport and logistics so if you're shipping goods and services around the world how do you, you know, you need to calculate those things. Now, one interesting thing about that is almost every industry has in their industry bodies and governing bodies are creating these uh, sustainability standards and calculations. So there's something called the GLEC in the logistics industry made up of some of the biggest logistics brands and shipping brands. You know, they've come up with a set of practices and a set of models that companies can use to actually work out what those emissions are as part of their own calculations. On the retail side, you know, uh, I was on a call earlier today where they, you know, they're a sustainable fashion website and they only want to sell sustainable brands. And the, the question was, how do we measure and how do we index the um, sustainable nature of the particular product that we're selling? So, you know, the challenge is being able to go to the brand and say, OK, well, let's help you work out what that is, you know, so. So these are all, you know, these are some of the factors. So if you imagine, if you have the data, there's a whole set of things you can do with data uh, around, uh, around sustainability. And it's impacting almost every single area of a company and also impacting um, investment strategies big time in every, every, single, uh, every single type of investor. So what's in it? What's in it for enterprises? And why would they want to do this? And primarily, the, the driving force is regulation. Until regulation came along, nobody really did anything, even though, yes, you know, we're being screened and we're being sustainable and we're using different material. The reality was companies were pretty slow at making change. Now regulation has come in. It's really forcing people to think about it. And actually now it's become front and center in terms of an agenda in most countries and in most companies. So it's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a voluntary thing anymore. Companies have to do it. If their brand wants to be around, they have to be at the forefront of this, you know, but actually there are opportunities. This is not about saying this is all an, a burden, a, a burden and an obligation. It's actually saying, well, how can we build new types of products and more sustainable products? How do we replace our, you know, polluting products with more sustainable products? How do we build better strategies and operating models in our business to be more efficient? I mean, it's not just about sustainability, actually, you can, it's not a competition between being more efficient and being more sustainable. These things are aligned. You know, things like um, cutting your energy usage, being able to understand what your emissions are and planning to reduce your energy usage is something that would, is great for everybody, right? Why would you waste energy? Um, 
and it actually will give companies a competitive edge. The ones that do it well, the ones that do the measurement, the ones that prove it, and then obviously are great at marketing that to customers, whether it's a B2B customer or consumer, these guys are going to win. You know, these guys are going to win because people go to them because they they are being more sustainable and they're faster and they're proving it. I mean, the, the element here is proving it. That that's a, that's a big big part. So that was it, really. I mean, uh, thanks for listening. I think I had fifteen minutes, and hopefully I haven't gone over fifteen minutes. Um, and thanks very much. I, I managed to ask the question, so so it's, uh, I'll just read out the question. So I'm glad Alpesh, you're covering the most important aspect on sustainability ESG, especially in pharma space. Look forward to tech involved in decarbonization and quantitative disclosure. Okay, so he's just um, making a statement. So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Alpesh, thank you so much. I think we do have several questions, but what we will do is just take a very short break uh, for two minutes and then we will um, dive into a quick um, panel session. Um, so um, to all of our speakers, please stay with us um, and uh, allow yourselves just a couple of uh, moments to get refreshed and we will return in just two short minutes. Um, until then, for those of, of our um, audience who are with us, if you have any questions um, or comments or feedback, please remember to send them across. Um, particularly for questions, you need to send that in the Q&A box below. And if it's a question that is specific to a certain speaker, again, please um, do name who it is that you would want to have answer that question. Um, so uh, yes, we will see you back here in uh, just two moments. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. And thank you for those who have also joined us recently. Um, just for your reference, this entire conference is being recorded and it will be shared with um, all of you um, shortly um, via an email link as well. Hmm. Just to note that in the chat, we have several links and um, profile um, links as well for some of our speakers and some of the content that has also been shared as well. Okay, let's move on to our panelists. If I could kindly ask for all of our speakers today to um, join us with your cameras and to also unmute yourselves as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much for um, joining us and for returning as well. Um, we actually have a couple of additional um, speakers who will be joining this specific panel today. Um, I think um, also to provide some support for some of the more technical questions. But um, so I will introduce you in, in a um, short moment. But again, I, I would ask that if any of our audience have additional questions, please send them now, or if you would like to follow up on some of the um, comments made by our speakers, then please feel free to do so. And I would ask you to direct them directly into the Q&A box below. Um, so joining us in addition to our speakers from earlier, we have um, Alexander Yurvorsky, who is a project manager at Deep Knowledge Group. Um, Alexander, hello. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Hello, he is also a mathematician with a pharma background who is focusing on leveraging big data and machine learning in order to create predictive analytics and database market insights for longevity financial advisors, which Talbot is also um, involved with, and um, also the world's first longevity focused capital advisory firm. Combining different ML based approaches, he leads the next generation customized IT platform for venture capital and private equity. Alexander is interested in mathematical and AI applications in investment, finance, banking, and other areas. Um, and it notes that you also speak six languages fluently, including Chinese, Ukrainian, and German, which is re really impressive. <laughs> But I, I would expect, expect no, no less from um, somebody with your accomplishments, for sure. Um, we also have with us uh, Nikita. Yes, I, I see you are online. Hi, yeah, Nikita. Hello. So we have uh, Nikita Bursenev. He is a quant analyst at Deep Knowledge Group, a quantitative analyst, former researcher in the field of matrix theory and control theory, which is ICS RAS. Um, he is interested in financial models, including stock performance production based on financial and non-financial parameters. At Deep Knowledge Group, he provides quantitative analysis and performs market research, as well as developing pricing models. 
Um, he has several years of experience in managing long equity portfolios, and he holds a master's in physics from MIPT, which is based in Moscow, and currently is finishing his master's of finance course at the University of Bologna. Um, and I believe you are also a CFA candidate and you've passed as a few of your exams with one pending. Yes, yes that's Congratulations. right. Congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, welcome back to our panelists from earlier. We have Alpesh, Talgat, and Anastasia Korshik, and of course, um, Dimitri Kaminsky. Um, so let's begin our uh, panel discussion. Um, I, I would like to start with a, a question that I'm, I'm going to put out there, which I think is a very broad question, and forgive me for my naivety in asking this, but we have several members of our, of our audience who are joining today who may have just been introduced to the concept of um, you know, investment technology and innovations in investment. So I would like to ask, um, and again, forgive me for um, such a basic question. Are investment technologies worth investing time and money for? And if so, why? And I would be very interested to hear some you know, short arguments from um, various uh, um, speakers today as to, as to what you would say. And I suppose your elevator pitch to those who have um, joined um, this sort of frontier of technologies um, and are intrigued. So, uh, who would like to who would like to take a? I, I would probably um, start <clears throat> a little bit and then give uh, a word to Anastasia. So, um, of course, everybody of you are quite aware about CRM, Client Relational Management System, and there are many of them, and most of them are quite typical. And um, two years ago, actually, probably the first effort was three years ago. Uh, we were considering. Um, you know, to, to buy such CRM, professional CRM system, and then somehow to, uh, you know, a little bit adjusted towards, uh, let's say, business development to, in the best case scenario, uh, towards investment relations. And um, what we have found that uh, there are actually probably two or three possible solutions, each of them uh, either very expensive and not very much efficient, uh, or either they are uh, cheaper, but will require quite a lot of uh, software programming to, uh, you know, design them. And eventually, we understood that um, uh, even the best possible, like really sophisticated solutions, they are not that best in the sense that for for our purposes, uh, not sale force uh, will not work in full capacity. Not uh, even something similar. In fact, they are a little bit cheaper, just less promoted systems compared with Salesforce. Uh, so we're, we're admitting this. Uh, in our case, uh, for our investment decision uh, making for, you know, to design our investment strategies, we had to design uh, our own proprietary big data ecosystem for actually investment decision maker uh, making in our case, like uh, for, for our uh, deals. <laughs> But now we are kind of going even further. So we're kind of uh, working to implement our own, not CRM, but IRM system, investment relations management system, specific software with uh, some, uh, uh, some machine learning uh, techniques, uh, which will be specifically designed to automize uh, in some capacity, some routine process, which any um, company will be facing whenever they will want uh, you know, to, to make some kind of any uh, technical fundraising process doesn't matter on the side of uh, uh, startups which are looking for investors so vice versa on the side of investors because each of the investor for, for deal flow uh, some uh, assistance to the technical stuff in, in venture any venture fund investment fund they will have to, to do quite a lot of routine uh, routine uh, boring uh, work which could be very well optimized uh, in nowadays in, in using um, some specific good uh, software solutions. So um, on, on stage probably with, without you know too much specific details because uh, this is a little bit of proprietary solution, but uh, just to, to iterate a little bit on the idea that uh, whenever any two parties uh, kind of, I would say in this sense, which want you know to, to get married but in, in this case to, to be matched um, in this case be, between uh, investment artists and investors so there is a lot of 
technical routine process, uh, which uh, should be improved, optimized, and uh, just enhanced with software. The very same as a lot of things already were um, improved and uh, resolved with uh, software development over the last uh, 10, 20 years, uh, since you know that the proper uh, implementation of internet happened everywhere. Uh, sure, Dmitry. So thank you for the speech. And uh, also, I would like to continue that nowadays uh, the AI and uh, different software solutions that allow us uh, to find the perfect match, as well as our big data analytics dashboards, they also allow us to match the investor with the startup that he's looking for as well as to find the contacts and to get all the information like dynamic SWOT analysis and um, comparing tools to compare the startup with another companies to see who is his competitors and etc. As well as nowadays uh, you can as I showed in my presentations, that you can uh, use different invest tech solutions to build your own portfolio, to compare different companies, uh, to manage your assets, and even issue actually my certificate using such data tool. Uh, moreover, these days they are quite touching for all the investors considering the environment, the recession, and especially in these days, uh, many investors they are seeking for the targets where to invest in because um, they need to find this way uh, to avoid uh, the recession of their real assets. And in this case, uh, the usage of the new structured products like uh, MCs and special purpose vehicle companies uh, could be an answer as well as uh, finding a good company. And in this case, we're also launching uh, the longevity and deep tech uh, SPV platform where all the investors can find the perfect match, like as Midri said, the marriage uh, with the perfect company as well as the company could issue its own SPV and uh, as well as use the IRM system. So there are many approaches on how to solve all these challenges these days. Thank you. Would anybody else like to jump on that? Or to, to add anything in terms of the um, huge advantages that they feel can be brought? Yeah, I'll just add a couple of cents. Um, so uh, AI ML is getting increasingly irreplaceable in the field of investing. Um, you know, there are some um, estimates uh, which say now that the vast majority are in fact uh, adopting these methods. Um, it gives uh, the manager uh, an extraordinary amount of scale uh, and scope in terms of coverage of various markets and sectors, which they can now do without having to invest in uh, you know, a staff of fundamental analysts who go through research reports. It's all available in data form. And so here you have the machines do it uh, mm -hmm. and do it in real time, which would not be the case otherwise. Uh, and so speed uh, of computation uh, basically far exceeds anything done away from AI and ML uh, and um, accuracy, um, you know, working with a sharp pencil instead of a broad brush, uh, that's huge. Uh, and uh, making numbers-based predictions instead of qualitative assessments mm -hmm. on buy and sell and how much to buy and sell. Uh, these are all separate facets that uh, you know, AI and ML bring yeah. and in general, quantitative investment brings. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned some of the predictions because we are um, speaking relatively um, in terms of AI being a really useful tool to assist. But what, where are we in terms of trusting AI with and trusting not just AI, but technology in general with investment decisions, especially where we have risk involved? Yeah, so uh, again, I'll just um, add my uh, thoughts, and they are not by any stretch of the imagination the answer, but um, you know, no uh, singular AI model uh, provides uh, the gospel truth. And so 
uh, by and large, everyone uses an ensemble approach where they use different uh, AI machine uh, or models to make their individual predictions. And they use uh, then uh, some approach to sensibly combine the outputs uh, to determine the strength of uh, you know, the decision. So um, again, um, you know, if you ask any person implementing the model or the strategy, uh, they'll all have different answers and there's no one perfect answer as well as it. Of course, would anyone want to add to that in terms of- Yeah, I would like to add a couple of points uh, to my colleagues already in terms of uh, IRM platform that uh, has been developed by Deep Knowledge Group. Uh, speaking from the personal experience and the experience with dealing with startups and investors, uh, capital raising procedures can be draining because uh, especially when you do uh, everything uh, in terms of not quantitatively, but qualitatively and uh, especially draining not only for the personnel who is actually responsible for uh, searching investors or searching startups, it can be draining like and for founders as well, for managing partners, because it takes lots of time mm -hmm. and it takes away your focus on your main business. And when you actually involve AI into the process, uh, it's not only about trust, but it actually saves you lots of time. This mm -hmm. has been pointed by my colleagues. And uh, time is, we know time, time is money. And it actually helps to accelerate the whole business process and the process of matching, of engaging for both the investment, investors and the capital raisers. And uh, speaking more in terms of trust, Yes, uh, I think we definitely and absolutely can trust AI because uh, sometimes, like most of the times, people make mistakes as well. So uh, if you like, for example, looking for a company to invest, there is no absolute guarantee that you won't do a mistake. But what AI does is uh, it's, uh, it does number crunching and numbers don't lie. Absolutely. Especially that's why I use my presentation, for example, I wanted to make an input of uh, as much statistics as possible, because uh, when you look at the numbers, they tell the real story. And what AI actually helps is to gather and take away all the noise and uh, put uh, numbers on the table. Absolutely. So that's why I think we can absolutely trust AI, especially in, in the platforms. I think trust is a very, very key um, concept here because um, a lot of what you've, you've mentioned in terms of visibility, blockchain is a fantastic example of how you can actually have that, that visibility to, to reestablish your trust in terms of, you know, a lot of the processes and the actual journey that um, a lot of the, um, those decisions have taken. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it was more wondering what can we do to, especially with AI and some, you know, of the, of the real frontier technologies, to make it more reliable. So, you know, whereas you've got in front of you sort of um, um, uh, the blockchain journey and what you see and what's happened, as opposed Absolutely. to- Absolutely, I think it's more about how we happened. use it. Yeah. And what can we do to make that process more reliable? And again, to allow for people to trust and to take that leap, to allow for that decision-making process to belong and to be responsible, um, well, to be led by AI. How can we make, um, you know, as technologists and as investors and people who are interested in pioneering these innovations, what can we do to ensure more reliability behind these products? It, um, it's an interesting concept. I mean, it doesn't have to be a question answered. It's perhaps more food for thought. <laughs> if anybody yeah, as you rightly said, like, uh, it depends how we use it. Uh, so uh, this is where the core of the trust comes from. I mean, uh, we can use it to gather information to extract all the necessary points that we need. But uh, at the end of the day, it's how we use it and what do we do with it. This mm -hmm. important how we proceed uh, our decisions. So this is why uh, we definitely can trust it. But um, all the outcome depends on the people at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I can see that we've had a few more questions um, in our uh, Q&A as well and some comments. So um, 
uh, sort of building upon the, the, the concept of behind AI, um, Adam um, Wasaja would like to ask, how can AI help with businesses um, in business evaluation of private company startups for investment by private equity? <laughs> Alpesh, I can see that that's an intriguing question. Is it more that it's uh, we're not there yet or it's something for us to think about? I don't necessarily think you need, well, I suppose you could, you could build a bunch of AI models by looking at historic data from companies and their performances. I don't necessarily think you need AI. You could just use statistics. You know, if you want to say, if you, if you say statistics is a branch of AI, then yes. Um, a lot of companies do that. Let's be honest. You know, um, a lot of investors do actually sophisticated modeling to understand mm -hmm. valuations of companies. You know, they take, they look at market segments, all the big VCs, if you name any tier one VC, they have a team of people looking at this, they look at the markets. Um, so it's already happening, I would say, in terms of valuations. You know, so when you walk in and a company and a, and a, and a sector, most of these guys already know what, what your company's valued at, given the traction you have, because they'll have done the research. That's why, let's be honest, if you look at any VC that's investing Series B rounds um, in law, they know that we need to invest X amount of money. So they already know. I mean, they already know this stuff. I would say private equity firms are probably not that sophisticated i don't know i'm not a private equity firm guy <laughs> but i don't think they're as sophisticated as some of the venture capitalists that, I, that, that if you talk about the tier one venture capitalists like uh anderson horowitz and Greylock and some of the others sequoia these guys have teams working on this yeah those are more sophisticated private equity guys will do valuations based on in quotes traditional valuation models i'm sure they have market models they've built some of the private equity firms i'm sure they have market models they've built so I, I, you know, frankly, you're at a disadvantage if you're if you're going as an early stage company to a, a private equity firm because they have they know more about it than you do. The most sophisticated ones know way more about it than your business than you do and where it fits and what the value of the business could be. Hence, what they, where they offer you a valuation and offer you an amount of money. I mean, it's as simple as that because they know. Um, would anybody else like to comment on that? Yeah, private equity uh, basically has a longer time horizon, and so maybe is not best suited as an application uh, as compared to, say, a hedge fund strategy where, you know, tomorrow's performance counts, and then, you know, this month's performance counts on the back of tomorrow's performance. So uh, that's where, you know, AI can really stand out and differentiate itself. Okay, well, interesting. Um, we have had a, a, a I'd, I'd say it's a rather bold statement, uh, statement. so I'm curious to have you either agree or disagree, panelists and speakers. And um, from Vijay Kumar Mishra, we can't say that AI is always right. This is the human who builds AI models. So only reproducible and rigorously tested models can be thought to use. Do we agree or do we disagree? Or is it not that simple? Yeah, I think uh, I can yeah probably answer the question. So um, th that's true that um, you know um, AI. So, so basically, if we think um, about AI as, as an algorithm, let's say um, it's it's true that it it can it can make you know um, false statements in a sense that um, you know it's 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 not his decision to make a certain statement, right? It, it's programmed to 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 make. A, uh, to produce certain results uh, when you feed certain data uh, to this algorithm. So um, yeah, basically if uh, AI or machine learning as an algorithm uh, has, you know, um, has provided you with the results that are somehow, um, uh, that, that cannot be qualified as, as, as a good result, it's definitely not the fault of the algorithm, right? It's the fault of the guy who, who wrote the code. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's true. but. Um, th that's uh, that's another question that we have here, and yeah, you are totally right, Roxy. It's not that easy to to you know to define whether it's true or not. But I would add that um, when we are talking about AI, we basically you know it's 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 super important if we talk not only about the algorithm itself because algorithm, trust me, it, you you can write whatever algorithm you, you want to write. It's basically you have like no limitations to be honest. The, the only like one of the major limitations that you tend to encounter when you're working with a uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence or whatever you call it is basically the data even in math it's it's always the data it's always the uh, like it's always what you fit to your uh, algorithm and here we have like a a, a big problem because uh, the way we um, 
you know, the way you manage your data, what type of data you tend to use and how exactly you, uh, to, how exactly you govern these uh, cases when, um, you, how you make sure that the data is not poisoned, for example, by one of your competitors, how you make sure that there is, uh, that, that you have, you know, uh, excluded all the noise how you make sure you know that the loss function or any other functions or you know uh, are working properly so th this is this is the, the the real problem that we have to be honest and um when we're talking about about like uh you know being sure that we we, we fed the data and algorithm produced as the results we actually want depending on the type of algorithm we tend to use if it's something simple like um well, let's say um um, I don't know, like feed forward neural network. Mm -hmm. It might be, it might be quite understandable what's going on. But uh, if we if we move further and dive into the deep learning, uh, the, the the further we go, the harder for us to to uh, to unpack this black box of AI. And uh, this basically most of the time prohibits, um, you know, our understanding of what's going on and whether the AI or the guy who wrote the code basically. You know, understands the, the the business problem he or she uh, you know tries to solve. So th this is this is the the real case. And uh, in my opinion, we need to be really cautious because yeah, it's I totally agree with Kashik that yeah, AI or machine learning definitely it's 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 a hot topic right now, and we definitely see how it captures different markets, different areas of our, um, you know, um, current work, and no matter like uh, w w what the, yeah. um, you know, what the area is, basically. Uh, but it's it's true that we need to be cautious when we are applying it, because it's, it's a lot of cases when you can basically apply uh, another model, which works perfectly. It has you no know, these problems with data poisoning or, you know, these uh, biases or, uh, you know, black box problem or anything else. And it works just fine. So okay. the, this this is the, the real case. And most of the time, such models tend to be uh, computationally uh, they tend to be uh, less greedy in terms of computations and power and time you need to spend on it. So so th that's true. But uh, it, it is fact also that for certain cases, machine learning uh, can like outperform uh, certain algorithms. And the, the 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 reason we use AI, it's not because in my opinion, it's not because it's always right, but because there are certain cases when you cannot um, cannot make sure that you are yourself right, right? So, so you you just you just cannot manage to you know go through all the data you have or you know fit into the model that you have right now. So it's, it's, you just like have only one option to use machine learning. So okay. th this is fortunately <clears throat> or unfortunately the 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 the, uh, could, the world we are there, living. Could there be consideration to perhaps? Um, for collaborative um, technology. So um, think of it as a hybrid. So we don't solely rely on AI and machine learning for the entire um, management of, of, of that um, uh, product, I suppose, and that outcome um, uh, rather. So for example, touching back on blockchain, you mentioned um, in terms of it, it's hard to know whether the, the data has been fed in or it's been, it's been cheated by a competitor. But then by bringing in other frontier technologies, you could rule those out. And so you could, in, in effect, strengthen, um, by creating that baseline, strengthen these um, uh, the, um, the, the output and the decision making that we are currently not wanting to be too reliant on by the use of other more reliant technologies that are that can act as a, a um, constructive, um, um, I suppose, um, supplementary product. Yeah, I definitely could agree with this statement. So basically, compared to uh, some other, you know, approaches, let's call them purely mathematical approaches, it's it's not the, the best definition, uh, but the, the, the best one I can come up with right now. Um, AI compared to those approaches are rather a um, interdisciplinary area. So you basically need to apply not only mathematics or not only um, computer science, you know, in order to come up with the model with, which basically you know, um, gives you the, the, the right result. And it tends to be the truth that you need to apply, as was mentioned before by our panelists, that basically you, you cannot apply just month of the time, just one algorithm solely, right? You, you need to apply in a, a bunch of algorithms and uh, in, in order to um, get the result that basically makes sense, right? So uh, that's, that, that, that's totally true. And uh, I believe that 
in as uh, you know in, in the future when AI will be even more developed as it is now, in comparison to as it is now, uh, we will be able to apply certain collateral technologies right to uh, to boost the, the the current level because uh, even though AI is a hot topic right now and people really love it and, uh, and that, that's true that it's comparatively new technology. It's not comparatively new in terms of math, that's true, but uh, in terms of the technological, um, um, you know, realization and, uh, you know, I said how it works, uh, it's definitely comparatively new. So uh, I'm pretty sure that um, more to come uh, in terms of AI and yeah, we, we definitely uh, will see uh, how it rises with the, with the use of certain uh, collateral solutions uh, as a blockchain, for example. Yeah, lovely. And um, would anybody like to expand on that or? Or any further? Yes, Alpesh. No, I think I I did my first AI algorithm, AI thing, long, long time ago. I think you know that I don't think you can generalize around the application of AI. You know, the the, the use case specifics matter. So if you got safety critical use cases where lives depend on it, that's a different set of uh, provability that you have to do on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I've worked on. Um, engine oil displays in helicopters where if things you know you've got to, it's got to work or the plane falls out of the sky and people die right you know if you're talking about so I, I don't think in generalized around the application of AI across um, everything you've got to be very specific on use cases and industries and applications that, that's something for me. so you know we the generalized thing we do is we were working in data and AI for 15 years so so for, for us it's you know, in the context that we're applying it, we're applying it as a mentor on sustainability. Um, I had a question today from somebody saying, well, can you measure the uh, uh, the, the carbon footprint of a T-shirt accurately? And I said, well, you can estimate it using a model, but it's not, who knows whether it's accurate or not, because there's no reference point. You know, yes, you can benchmark against other data, but that data is also not accurate because it's not measured using real data. Now, interestingly, there's a whole new industry that's emerged recently called synthetic data. I don't know if you heard about synthetic data where what people are doing is effectively creating data artificially using models to then feed into AI models to train them. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting, uh, so, you know, so we're seeing that kind of thing emerge because if you can't train the AI model to recognize something, let's say it's a visual thing or, you know, like, recognizing i don't know a card i don't know we're making it up but then you need to train your data and you need to label it how the hell do you get training and labeling data well you have to collect it well if you can't collect it what do you do well you can create synthetic data the other thing around so that, that's one point the, the second point i would say is that ai is just very early in most organizations if you if you go however much the hype says ai is everywhere the reality is you go to most companies that point solutions around one little use case that they've implemented these use cases may be big for a particular organization, but actually only a very few, few companies out there are leveraging AI to scale. Primarily the problem is bringing data together. If you can't bring your data together, it doesn't matter what you can, you can do. So the digitally native companies like the Netflixes and the Facebooks and those kind of the big native ones that you'll know about, these they built their business from the ground up to make sure they have all the data and then overlaying that AI stuff. So operationally, there isn't that idea around having that data. What I think is going to happen, and it's going to take years and most companies, is that AI layer, the data layer and AI layer across a business. And then, you know, these point solutions integrating to that layer. Because at the moment, all these companies are coming out with a different AI say, I've got a model for computer vision. I've got a model for, I don't know, financial calculations. And there's hundreds of these little companies building a point solution for one thing. But the data set they need to use is the same. Well, they say, well, Give us your data and we'll we'll run the AI on it. So well, I don't want to give you my data because my data is all over the place in my organization. And to, I need you to overlay your model into my data, not the other way around. So that's the biggest operational challenge that I see is that AI to scale needs things turning the other way around, not these little companies building models and saying, hey, I can do this with this, this particular model, but actually bringing those layers of the stack together into an enterprise and then overlaying operationalizing how AI is going to work in a business. And the digital native companies already do it. That's why they're so far ahead. Most companies are nowhere near doing that. So there you go. There are a couple of points that I wanted to, what well, I thought I would make. But there's plenty of room for improvement, just not right now. It's down the line, is, I think, essentially. I think with what, what we're all agreeing on is it's there, but it's just not quite right. 
Okay, so let's move on to, um, I think let's move off from AI and um, going back to um, the questions. So let's, um, we, we've had a few comments and questions from Manish Biani. Um, let's talk about ESG. Do you consider ESG score as one of the technical metrics? And do you mention technical metrics? So um, as an example, do you take patent, um, patent valuations into consideration? Does that question resonate with anybody that would want to take that? So I was just trying to understand the question uh, around patents. Um, I'm just trying to, where, where's the question? Um, uh, um, Manish, if you're still online, feel free to uh, just sort of clarify what you mean. But yeah, until, I'm. Yeah. Um, but until then, if we just you know want to have a um, a discussion looking at ESG score as, as one of the main me metrics. Well, of I can tell you, ESG scores scores are all BS right now. There there is no realism in any of these scores. They're all made up. The the data and the foundation of the scoring is complete proprietary, or they use screen scraping. They scrape sustainability reports and come up with a magic score, right? That's what's happening. Uh, and it's all greenwashing. There really isn't that. I mean, if, I don't know if you saw the press release recently where ExxonMobil was in the top four of ESG high level score and Tesla was didn't even make it to the top 100. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, okay, maybe Tesla's supply chain is not efficient, but actually an oil and gas company by their nature may may do net zero but the reality is this just does just make sense right so esg scores i don't believe any of them i wouldn't trust them however it's all relative so if you're in the financial market and you're taking esg scores from sustainalytics or another vendor it's all relative so you know they they grade the scores based upon their own internal model but they grade people based upon something which is relative to something else. So Nestle relative to, I don't know, pick it on another company, to Unilever. Mm. So relative. investors Absolutely. can make investment decisions to a certain extent because it's a relative score. You could say, well, actually, you know what? It's a relative score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Unilever's here, Nestle's here, you know, pick another fifth from CG companies here. Therefore, you know, you can sort of make investment decisions based on that. So I wouldn't say it's all crap, but... But it should be inappropriately used in a blanket way. Um, well, it's way. just not used. These, these, these. You know, if you're making investment decisions, which allow, you, which are our people, our money. You know, it's our pensions, money, and our investment money. And these com these um, investors are making these decisions based upon those things. Then it should mm -hmm. matter, and it's going to matter because for asset managers, invest investors, and in you know, private equity firms, SFDR is another regulation that's coming in. These guys have to prove this stuff. They're saying what the portfolio composition is. They have to prove what, what these um, portfolio makeup is and how the ESG scores fit in. So they can't just get away with saying, oh, yeah, we use the ESG index and so it's fine, right? And actually, there are 600 different ESG indexing companies out there. <laughs> right? So which one do you use? Well, I think someone just commented that that's actually a very interesting point. Koshik, what do you think? I could see that you uh, had a thought there. Yeah, so uh, I know um, based on uh, our chief quant that we do use an ESG score, but uh, I couldn't uh, tell you exactly how it's used in the long shot context, uh, but I know it's one of the factors that go into the model. Mm -hmm. uh, so not much to add there. Would anybody else like to add? On the ESG front, no. Um, so I think Manish explained what he meant by his question in terms of the um, patent, which is a number of patents or a content value potential evaluation. Does that add some context, or shall we move on to another question? Um, say one more time. So uh, his question was, for example, do you take patent valuations into consideration? And he expanded that the patent meaning the number of patents or content, the value potential um, is the evaluation. So it depends on the patent, right? So if it's a patent related to reducing emissions or being a, 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 a making the supply chain more efficient, yeah, um, to reduce emissions or creating a bio product based upon that. You know, I think man issues in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, bu building a pat patents around those areas. Yes, there's value in that around ESG. Absolutely. Because you're creating value and um, technology, which directly will reduce emissions. 
So that impact all, you know, social and governance. I don't know what you yeah. can do in social and governance around patterns, but you know, for 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 example, drug composition and using different uh, different um, ingredients to make a drug, and you're using you created a patent around that, which adds a sustainability element. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I can see that of being value and the value, the ESG calculation on that could be could 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 have an impact on valuation. Absolutely. Okay, um, I think he commented further um, on uh, Dow Jones and um, sustain analytics um, and the rigorous green technology. But I think what you've said, it kind of covers that quite nicely, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of invention around clean tech, as it's called. There's huge amount of invention on around bio products, on food products, on. I mean, there's so much innovation going on. I don't know how and a, a big chunk of these companies are doing are patenting those things. Yeah. Like right. um, what's it called? Yeah. Impossible meat. Impossible. The meat is it meat? The meat company. Impossible. Beyond. Improbable or whatever it's called. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, not beyond. I, I think I know which. Beyond. Yeah, beyond meat. Those guys. They've patented <laughs> stuff around going whatever, right? So you know that that's that's valuable. I don't know how it. Funnily enough, we will be touching upon that um, at a. Uh, we, we have a conference next week on um, sustainability and food tech, which is on the I think the sixth or the seventh of June. But I'll, I will double check. Um, so for those that are specifically interested um, in that area, we will share a link um, for how you you can get involved and we can expand upon um, um, that conversation because I know it's quite a controversial topic, um, with many myths that are uh, in need of being dispelling and and um, conversation to be had. Uh, I believe it's Tuesday. Day. Um, okay, I know that we need to wrap up quite soon. So I, I just want to ask one more question, um, which is an earlier question right at the start, um, uh, which is going back into the um, SPAC model. Um, so there are a few comments about this. Uh, so one, do we believe that the SPAC model is not favorable for tech companies? And why do we consider that targets that went public via um, SPACs are unsatisfied, considering that SPACs are performing better than traditional IPOs? Who would like to take a stab at that? I think, yeah, I, I can I can just uh, make a, a quick note on these SPACs and this, this type of question. So, um, it, it always, uh, when we try to compare two things, it's uh, important to, to decide, uh, you know, what is your benchmark, right? <laughs> uh, so if, if we would compare SPACs to the traditional IPOs, um, I, I'm pretty sure there are different cases, to be honest. And uh, for certain companies, SPACs definitely might be a, a great uh, opportunity to, to, to raise money and, you know, to run public and, and all of this stuff. But uh, it, from, from the, from the whole, I mean, personally, I not that like the, the, the whole idea of early, early, you know, early stage companies going public because uh, in many cases, if it's a pharma company, uh, at least right now, we have this problem where um, company, ten, you know, they, they tend to, um, to not to get that much uh, attention to their technology, right? So the, the great idea and the, the, the pure realization of this idea, and this basically leads to the to the to those cases where, where um, companies they raise millions and tens of millions of dollars and they just went public where Spark, for example, because it's easier and convenient for companies, and then they just uh, fail. You know, uh, even pretty much it's 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 often that even before the the clinical trials, right? Even before the phase one, and this basically is is not it's it's not great not only for investors but only for for this company in particular right because uh they have compromised their technology and probably their team for for some time at least right so um i i, I don't uh, i i'm I, i'm not sure that spark as a as, a, as an approach it's it's really something bad for, for the company at least but it's definitely something that might you know um spoil the uh, the CEO also different companies and basically led them to the wrong conclusion conclusions about their technology sustainability their progress as a company the investment readiness level of their technology which might lead to the um, to the results uh, they, they they definitely don't want to face in the future where you know um, in the case of the fail they, they it would be much harder for them to, to raise capital and if they would 
uh, let's say, wait for, for a year or two, they might, uh, you know, um, adjust their technology, making it more sellable, you know, finding better, uh, I don't know, scientific advisors and so on and so forth. And after that, making this uh, leapfrog, you know, and launching their technology. So, so yeah, this, this, this is the way I see it uh, in this case. Absolutely. Um, uh, Anastasia, Nikita, would you like to add on that? Uh, or are you happy with Alexander's response? Is there anything that you would want to expand on? I could say that uh, these days, uh, these are quite challenging for the companies raising funds, especially going public. It, it doesn't matter the, either they go for Spark or an IPO. Um, their retail investors, they could be afraid of putting their money like these days because of uh, um, the markets going down, like S&P 500 going down. So in this case, going for a Spark, uh, these days could be rather challenging. So in this case, sometimes it's could not be successful strategy as it was like a few years ago. So in this case, uh, I would advise just to go for the traditional way of the private equity strategy. So in this case, it would be more interesting for such companies just to wait and then go public, then go for an IPO. But still, a SPAC could be an interesting idea if you already have built the community of the investors interested. So you need also to build your community on the secondary market before you go for this pack. Lovely. Um, okay, wonderful. So I think um, if there are any final comments from our speakers today, um, please do um, have, have a moment to make them now. Uh, let's wrap up for the evening uh, or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, so um, I just want to say that we, um, obviously this is day one, this is a two day um, conference and we will be back tomorrow um, uh, at 4 p.m. BST as well. So same time uh, tomorrow. And um, please do feel free to join. And if you have had some thoughts about the content that you've reviewed today, then you will have an opportunity to um, possibly you know ask us about that again to, tomorrow i just want to say a, a special thanks to the person who is behind the deep knowledge group icon here which is katrina marilich who has basically been organizing and driving the session today um i think we briefly heard your voice earlier so thank you very much to um katrina for managing um this event and for also managing the chat and the q a along with Tanya Bell as well. Um, so yes, thank you very much everybody for joining today's um, conference and discussions. Um, so again, we have recorded this session. It will be made available to all of our attendees today. You will receive an email hopefully quite soon. And um, it's been my absolute pleasure to, be, um, to have been your host this evening. And I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow at 4 p.m., uh, which is UK time. Have a wonderful evening, a wonderful day, and I will see you all tomorrow.